Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we're very excited to have you. This is, of course, the truth about cannabis. Um, I'm just going to do some housekeeping just to get it out of the way before we start. Uh, so this event will be recorded, uh, but only our panellists have access to microphones and cameras. So if you are one of our audience members, we can't see or hear you, you won't be in the recording. If you have questions, and we hope that you do have questions, then please put them into the Q&A function, not the chat. Um, and if you've got any other comments or you think we're having technical difficulties like I just did, uh, then please feel free to put something in the uh, chat and let us know. Uh, if you drop off the call for any reason, just join using the same link um, that you're using right now. Uh, I will introduce the beginning of each of our sort of three topics that we'll be going through. So that's uh, recreational use of cannabis, um, technology in cannabis, and medical cannabis and research. I will not be going through everyone's feel, uh, kind of full bios just because of timings, but do look on the Eventbrite if you want to read a bit more about each of our speakers. So uh, without any further ado, I will start our first section, which is about recreational cannabis. We'll be hearing from Professor David Nutt, Dr. Caitlin Norman and Steve Rolls. And um, I'll start with Professor David Nutt, please. Thanks, Anna. I will just share my screen. I'm delighted to talk about the harms of cannabis because it's a topic that's been uh, much debated for at least several centuries. Not everyone uh, is aware of the fact that uh, the British Empire was funded largely from the drug trade, uh, sent, forcing Indians to buy <laughs> cannabis that they grew themselves, and of course, forcing the Chinese to buy opium. Um, and back in the 1890s, there was concern about the deleterious effects of cannabis smoking in um, India that led to the Indian Hemp Commission in 1893-94. And uh, the uh, conclusions of that uh, commission were in this yellow box at the bottom here, cannabis is entangled. In 1894, the Indian Hemp Drugs Commission published results of a large study showing moderate use does not cause physical or psychological harm. And uh, I think we can say, that uh, statement has definitely stood the test of time, but has probably largely been forgotten and uh, certainly was, uh, was ignored by um, the government of Brown, of which this man, Alan Johnson, was the Home Secretary at the time, who decided that uh, he should um, sack me as their um, chair of the ACMD on the grounds that I would not be critical of the harms of cannabis. And, um, it was it became, cannabis became a, a powerful political tool for the Blair Brown government, trying to prove that they were as hard on drugs as the uh, com competing Cameron led Tory party. And one of the problems of uh, being hard on, tough on cannabis was it, it was really difficult to justify, given that there were very few deaths compared with most other drugs. Uh, and so they had to come up with some interesting justifications for keeping it illegal. And, and, and this was actually to keep it even out of medicinal use, not just out of recreational use. And they, um, they came up with uh, three potential harms, schizophrenia, driving, and this concept of skunk lethality, which was a, a Gordon Brown uh, invention. Uh, and I just want to look at each of them. What are the most... Uh, graphic examples of how uh, a drug policy can fail is this one where the misuse of drugs act coming in 1971 seemed to have very little impact on the use of cannabis with a 20-fold increase in use over the first 40 years of the misuse of drugs act it's now cut out out of it so enormous increase in use probably a hundred times the amount of cannabis actually used um, and uh, if that was causing serious problems like schizophrenia, we might have seen an increase in schizophrenia or psychosis. But when you look at the time course when that would have been apparent, you see there wasn't any increase in the prevalence rates or the incidence rates either of, either of psychosis or schizophrenia. So that theory really was a theory um, that's never properly been evaluated or proven. What about driving? Well, the government's own report on driving, the Kim Wolf report, uh, showed very, very clearly that cannabis is way less harmful than um, alcohol on driving. And in fact, if you go on the drug science policy and law uh, 
website. You can also get this paper uh, and I think his recent lecture should be up on the drug science website. It's actually questionable whether cannabis has any negative impact on the risk of accident from your driving uh, or certainly serious accidents, but it's definitely no argument for making it illegal. And then what about skunk? One of the interesting things that happened back in the, uh, in the 2000s was that supposedly intelligent and uh, important members of the medical and scientific profession started making amazing claims about, about the harms of strong cannabis. So people said things like a hundred times more potent than hash. One spliff kills a million cells in the hippocampus. And it, it's a leading cause of schizophrenia. And of course, these claims are all utterly, utterly fanciful. Uh, but it does, the fact that these were made by one, one of those people was a, went on to be president of the Royal College of General Practitioners. One of them was a candidate for the, um, becoming the government's chief scientist. And one of them was a, a leading psychiatrist. Uh, and they're all wrong, but it, it shows how there was an enormous desire by uh, leader, thought leaders in medicine and, uh, and science to actually vilify cannabis. And to some extent, they succeeded because what made uh, the anti-cannabis lobby uh, in, encouraged prohibition of cannabis. And the effect of that was to distort the nature of the cannabis that was available in the UK. As you probably all know, uh, traditional forms of cannabis are a combination of Delta 9 THC and cannabidiol. And they have, in many ways, opposite effects. THC can make you anxious, it can make you psychotic, it can impair memory and learning. Cannabidiol can reduce anxiety, has antipsychotic effects, and may have some benefit on memory and learning. And they have kind of opposite effects in the brain, not directly in the receptors, but uh, they, they certainly kind of a dial clearly moderates and moderately dilates the effects of THC. And the problem is that the trying to get rid of all cannabis led to a distortion of the market so that it's now almost all THC. And this is uh, data that's uh, been collected on and off through police seizures and community samples, and now 95% or of, uh, of all cannabis that's on the street is strong, high THC cannabis. And that means it's very, very low in, in the protective element out of a dial. And that is almost certainly why the uh, stomach is more harmful to people's mental state than traditional cannabis. And Val Curran and Celia Morgan uh, showed this a long time ago, 2008. They showed that. Uh, looking at people using cannabis and rating them in their own homes, they sh that show that people who were generally at that time using strong high THC or THC alone products had more psychotic-like experiences than um, those who were using the THC CBD mixture. In fact, they also showed that the CBD mixture, the THC, actually seemed to improve people's uh, had an introversion and, and, and lack of pleasure. So here's a positive effect of THC, which may explain why people use it, or a positive effect of cannabis. Um, but the problem is by getting rid of CBD, we're forcing the population to using something that's more likely to cause psychosis and probably also dependence. And there's one other, one other really worrying consequence of the hysteria to prohibit cannabis, which is a significantly impeded research. Here you see the number of publications each year. Big inter interest in cannabis when people discover the receptors and then clamping down on availability of research materials uh, as part of this anti-cannabis, fear of cannabis campaign led to a, a very, very significant uh, period of a, a dearth of research for 20 or 30 years, which is only now started to pick up. I want to say just a few words about addiction and dependence. I mean, certainly the dependence does occur up to about 9% of recreational cannabis users. And it's probably more now than in the past because of the uh, predominance of this high strength, high THC, low CBD product. We know from the work of Tom Freeman uh, that uh, can, you can use cannabidiol in high doses to help people get off 
uh, THC. So actually removing THC is uh, and removing cannabidiol from the general availability available amounts of uh, of cannabis is uh, again accentuating the risk of dependence as it probably accentuates the risk of psychosis. And just as an aside, one of the things that we are looking at in the, in the Doug Science 2021 initiative is, is the possibility that there uh, might, you know, we're looking at the frequency of cannabis dependence in medical users. We, we, we suspect it would be way, way less than in recreational users. And uh, if you want to read more about the reasons, we think that there's this paper here, which again is available for free on the Drug Science website. And one of the reasons we, we are uh, less worried about dependence and addiction with medical cannabis is, is that there are many reasons why people become dependent on cannabis. And, uh, and, uh, and recreational users are, are much more likely to be using it to get euphoric. It's quite possible that many are self-medicating with this strong uh, forms of, uh, of the illegal market um, skunk. And of course, the settings are also different as well. And we, it's very likely that a more rational market which, uh, of cannabis, which Steve Rolls will talk about shortly, would significantly reduce the harms of dependence as well as the harms of uh, other harms from cannabis. So I'll stop now. Um, if you want to read more, you can read uh, one of these, these, the left hand book, The Drugs, The Other Hot Air, talks a lot about the cannabis policy and the and the right one is a new book I've just produced on cannabis itself. And if you, they're all available from the Drug Science website and the proceeds support the charity, Drug Science, which is of course supporting the meeting tonight. So I'll stop now. And unfortunately I'm giving a talk on uh, to addiction psychiatrists in about 20 minutes. So I have to disappear, but I will take questions now. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, I've, there's a couple of questions here. Um, so one is, uh, have you ever seen any drug interactions with THC or CBD? So CBD is a, a blocker of some of the cytochrome P450s in the liver. So, that, But the, the impact of cannabidiol on other drugs is almost is quite rare because you need to give quite high doses. So it only really becomes an issue when people are using sort of grams a day for, for epilepsy. Overall, it's not. There's not, there's really not a much of a risk. And THC you're using such low quantities that it has very little pharmacokinetic impact. Of course, there can be some pharmacodynamic functional impact, I mean, particularly getting to sedation. And you saw, actually, I didn't emphasize it, but you saw in the driving data that there was some, some additive effect of THC and alcohol on driving. So sedative drugs you know, could be, have their impacts enhanced by THC, but that's a dynamic, not a kinetic thing. Okay, and um, there's one question here, which is how hopefully you that the tide is changing in the UK in view of the global direction. I'm assuming around all the changes we've seen in sort of cannabis legislation and so on. Well, um, you know, I'm always hopeful, but uh, I'm also realistic. This, you know, it's, it's um, there's still a, a peculiar attitude of, in, uh, of many of, the, of our of our right-wing newspapers uh, against cannabis, recreational cannabis. I mean, the good, I mean, the fact is, you know, we do have one party that have all uh, lived demons of actually supporting recreational cannabis, partly for a, from a, what you might call a pragmatic and, a, and moral perspective, and partly from an economic perspective, it will bring an income and will probably reduce the harms of alcohol. But uh, currently, still in Britain, we know that our attitude to most drugs is, uh, is moralistic rather than pragmatic. And, uh, so I'm not as hopeful as, uh, I don't think we're going to move to recreational cannabis in the next year or so, but, but maybe, yeah, well, who knows, maybe, 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 in, maybe in my lifetime, let's hope so. Certainly. Okay, good. I think we've probably got time for just one more, so I'll just nab one. Um, oh, someone just popped another one in. Uh, okay, how much is tolerance and or familiarity a factor in safety or harms slash risks? Well, tolerance is clearly a significant factor in, um, in increasing the risk of dependence. Uh, but on the other hand, as I think this questioner probably is referring, it certainly probably reduces the risks if you're driving, uh, you know, in the same way as uh, you know, if you are tolerant to alcohol, you, you're less likely to be in to be in an accident um, uh, as a result of drinking. So it's, uh, 
It's kind of a bit of a double-edged sword, really. I don't recommend generating tolerance in order to make yourself less impaired, though generally it's better to maintain a, level, a, a reasonable level of uh, impact. Otherwise, you can run the risk. I mean, because dependence, of course, will also lead to withdrawal, which I didn't talk about, but which is a recognized phenomenon from heavy use of uh, cannabis over time. Mm. Fantastic. Um, well, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. I'll let you go and maybe have a small break before your next talk. <laughs> thank you. Sure. Um, but thank you, so thank you so much for chatting to us all today. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Brilliant. Um, so that is our first uh, talk. Please do keep your questions coming in. Um, and we will now be hearing uh, from Dr. Kate Norman. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm going to be switching over from cannabis to synthetic cannabinoids um, and discussing their pharmacology and effects. Um, so there are kind of three main categories of uh, cannabinoids. There's the endogenous cannabinoids or endocannabinoids, which are the uh, cannabinoids that are actually in your, uh, developed by your body. Uh, whereas the phytocannabinoids are those that are uh, isolated from the cannabis plant. And then synthetic cannabinoids are uh, man-made or synthesized. Um, there are 209 synthetic cannabinoids being monitored by the EU early warning system. Uh, and over 300 have been reported worldwide to the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Um, just to give you a little bit of an overview of where synthetic cannabinoids, uh, which we often call scraws, come from, uh, they were originally synthesized for research, mainly starting in the 1940s and 1950s, um, often mainly in, in relation to the uh, reported positive effects that uh, cannabis can have and research papers and patents documenting their synthesis and effects were published. The first scraws for recreational use were identified in Germany in 2008, uh, and these compounds were taken right out of the academic literature. Um, since 2008, the number of new scraws detected around the world has uh, significantly increased, as you can see in the little chart on the bottom right. Uh, and this is in part due to the enactment of legislation around the world where there was kind of a cat and mouse game uh, developed between producers and legislators, where the moment legislators would control one compound, uh, the producers would just slightly change the structure of the compound uh, and then release it uh, so that it would still be a legal high. I'm not gonna be using a lot of names for, uh, for scraws in this presentation, but just to give you a little background on it, um, the early research scraws were named after the person or organization that originally synthesized them. So JWH stands for John W. Huffman, CP stands for Charles Pfizer, and so on. When they were openly sold in head shops uh, in the UK, that stopped in after the enactment of the Psychoactive Substances Act in 2016. But prior to that, um, they were known under a variety of names, and that's where Spice uh, and K2, which is a common name for them in the United States, comes from. Um, but they also had a bunch of other ridiculous names like Scooby Snack and uh, Banana Cream Nuke. Uh, we tend to use a more scientific naming system based on the four main structural components of scraws, uh, the linked group, tail, core, and linker. Uh, so the, my main uh, thesis statement, I'll say, of this talk is that synthetic cannabinoids are not synthetic cannabis. The media often refers to them as such um, or synthetic marijuana. Um, but this is really not the case. Um, for one thing, scraws are full agonists of the cannabinoid receptors, whereas THC is only a partial agonist. So basically, if you think of the receptor as the lock and the ligand, so the scraw or the THC as the key, um, then THC is almost like trying to pick a lock with a, um, with a hair clip. Like it'll, it'll work, but it's not gonna work that well and it might take some time whereas the scraw is the perfect key that fits right in the lock and it turns really easily. Uh, in addition, scraws have been found to have up to be up to 500 times more potent than scraws, um, and they can also have different and more severe effects than scraws. Um, they've been found to have up to 30 times higher risk of adverse effects requiring emergency treatment than cannabis, and these effects are often more typical of psychostimulants such as methamphetamine than cannabis. 
Um, so just to give you a little bit of background um, on what causes the, why uh, scraws might have different effects from cannabis before I really go into the effects. Um, so binding affinity is essentially how strongly a ligand binds to a receptor. So in this case, the receptors are the cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2, and the ligand would be the SCRA or uh, THC. Um, the way that these are measured actually means that the lower value indicates a stronger binding affinity. And it's important to note that binding affinity doesn't indicate receptor activation. So it doesn't tell you if it's an agonist or an antagonist or so forth. Um, if you see, look at the chart on the right, um, you can see that THC uh, being only a partial uh, agonist of the receptor has a fairly uh, low binding affinity. It does not bind very well, it doesn't fit well in the receptor. Whereas scraws have a, can have drastically, <laughs> drastically different uh, binding affinities and they can have be very, very effective um, as you can see with the bottom ones there. On the other hand, potency is uh, the amount of a drug necessary to produce an effect. Um, and so this does indicate receptor activation, whether it's an agonist or antagonist, whether it activates or inhibits. Um, once again, just as with binding affinity, a lower value actually indicates greater potency. So once again, here you can see that THC is not very potent, um, whereas scraws have drastically different potencies uh, and can be, as I said earlier, up to 500 times more potent. We now have a fairly good understanding of the parts of the cannabinoid structure that can actually impact binding and potency, um, where the, <clears throat> the tail linker and methyl formate, which are in blue um, of the linked group affect binding, whereas the core and tertiary butyl moiety of the linked group, which are in red, um, affect potency. Um, and we can actually now start to make predictions about the binding, and, uh, binding affinity and potency when new compounds emerge. Um, however, it's still very important to actually do the um, binding affinity and potency studies um, because there can be such drastically different um, and that can have a severe, uh, various severe impacts on the, the user. In addition to binding affinity and potency, the metabolic clearance and distribution um, of scraws can also impact the effects. Um, so we know that scraws have rapid in vitro clearance rates and are quickly metabolized. So this means that it is being removed by the body very quickly. Um, so there is little to no parent compound that remains in biological fluids like urine and blood. Uh, this is actually one of the main reasons why scraws um, are used, so, uh, particularly by communities that are being monitored for drug use, such as in prisons or uh, uh, probation, because it makes it much more difficult to detect. Um, there is also preliminary evidence that scraws and their metabolites might be distributed into deeper compartments, uh, such as adipose tissues, and then released into the bloodstream later, even over one year after the last use. Um, so this could be one reason why scraws can have uh, prolonged effects, as I will talk about uh, in a moment. Um, so this is a general overview of the effects of scraws, um, and it can infect affect a number of different organs, um, including the heart, lungs, kidneys, and of course the brain. Um, if we start with the heart, um, endocannabinoids have been found to mediate the regulation of vasoconstriction and vasodilation, as well as myocardial contractility and lipid homeostasis. And scraws are believed to disrupt this mediation, uh, leading to these cardiovascular effects such as tachycardia or increased heart rate, uh, hypertension, uh, heart attacks, and acute cardiorespiratory failure. Um, but they, scraws have also been found to lead to acute kidney injury, which is the sudden loss of kidney function. It was actually first uh, detected by the uh, CDC in the United States. And it's been found that in some cases, hemodialysis is required in order to return uh, to regular kidney function. Um, and kidney failure has also been reported as a cause of death following scraw use. Moving on to the lungs, um, scraws have also been found to lead to increased oxygen demand and reduced oxygen supply. Um, reduced oxygen can have a number of different uh, severe effects, sometimes leading to death, including brain hypoxia or the lack of oxygen to the brain, cerebral and pulmonary edema, and acute cardiorespiratory failure. A recent study actually found that of 83 suspected scraw overdoses, 31 had acute respiratory failure. 
Um, there's also an increased risk of thrombosis or blood clots following straw use, which could contribute to that reduction in oxygen supply, but can also lead to ischemic strokes. Uh, in addition, in the brain, um, seizures are one of the most commonly reported effects of uh, scra use, as well as some negative psychoactive symptoms and dependence, which I'll talk about in a moment. A, there have been a number of uh, deaths uh, following uh, scra use, and a recent review found that cardiovascular effects are the most common mechanism that leads to death. Um, and it's been reported not only in people with pre-existing cardiopulmonary disease, but also in individuals with no reported problematic cardiac history. Behavioral risks were also reported as being one of the most common mechanisms leading to death, including falling from a height, wandering into traffic, excited delirium, as well as self-harm and suicide. Um, for those that were around during the, uh, you know, kind of methamphetamine uh, outbreak that happened in, in particularly in the States, um, these are much more common symptoms uh, or effects of psychostimulants, such as methamphetamine. Um, for psychoactive symptoms, um, acute anxiety and psychosis are two of the most commonly reported side effects of scra use. There was a recent review from a large UK hospital of patients presenting to the emergency department after taking uh, new psychoactive substances that found that the most common reason for admission following scra use was impaired consciousness. Uh, and there were a number of patients that they had said had uh, severely impaired consciousness. Um, although, and cannabis has been documented to trigger psychosis as uh, David Nutt discussed a little bit earlier, um, but scra actually, scraws actually present with some new challenges because they've been found to produce more prominent psychotic effects in cannabis and can tr trigger more severe effects that last longer for many users. Um, they've also been found to trigger psychosis in non-vulnerable individuals. Um, so people without a family or a personal history of mental health disorders, rather than just in vulnerable individuals like cannabis. For instance, if you look at people with schizophrenia, uh, if they take cannabis, it might uh, bring on some of their uh, psychotic uh, or schizophrenic symptoms, whereas if they take scraws, it will actually can create new symptoms that they didn't have before. Um, scraw use has been shown to actually result in a cognitive impairment profile similar to that of schizophrenia, um, and they've also been found to trigger symptoms that resemble schizophrenia, including the positive symptoms like hallucinations and delusions, as well as the negative symptoms like asociality and apathy. Um, but they have also been reports of aggression, self-harm, and self-mutilation, which, as I said earlier, are much more uh, related to uh, effects of psychostimulants. Uh, while the effects of scra use generally conclude after the period of intoxication for uh, some users, there have been reports of palpitations, anxiety, hallucinations, and insomnia lasting for several days after uh, abstinence of use, and in some cases, more than five months. Um, there's also been cases of extended psychosis uh, after scra use that required antipsychotic treatment, uh, even after abstinence of the scraws. Uh, and in some cases, it actually required inpatient treatment at psychiatric centers, uh, lasting an average of about eight and a half days. Um, as well as the higher potency and binding affinity, as I discussed earlier, there are a few other reasons that scraws could be have different effects from cannabis one of which is the lack of CBD. Um, CBD is actually a negative allosteric modulator, uh, which means it doesn't actually activate the cannabinoid receptors, but rather it, it uh, decreases the potency and efficacy of the ligand uh, that is binding to it, such as THC. Um, so as uh, David Nutt kind of said earlier, CBD has some um, uh, anxiolytic and antipsychotic effects that are believed to counteract the psychoactive effects of THC. Um, and this theory is supported by multiple studies that have found that cannabis strains with higher ratio of THC to CBD, that high potency cannabis or skunk, um, has a greater occurrence of psychosis. Another uh, possible reason for the different effects of scraws in cannabis is the direct interaction between uh, some scraws and neurotransmitter receptors. Uh, CB1 receptors are actually thought to modulate neurotransmitter systems, including dopamine and serotonin, 
Uh, however, THC itself does not have an affinity for the neurotransmitter receptors. Uh, on the other hand, um, some straws have been found to directly activate the dopaminergic system uh, and increased levels of dopamine is associated with the onset of psychosis. There's also been a link established between uh, anxiety, the anxiety induced by straw use and the mediation of the uh, serotonergic, uh, serotoninergic system. Uh, hyperfunction of the serotonin receptor has been shown to cause similar psychotic effects as schizophrenia. And finally, to look at addiction and withdrawal, uh, scraws have been found to be more addictive than cannabis. Scraw dependence has been found to develop quickly with many users uh, reporting alleviation and withdrawal symptoms as their primary reason for continued use. Uh, in fact, some daily users have reported the onset of withdrawal symptoms within 15 minutes after smoking scraws. Um, moderate withdrawal symptoms of scraws are similar to the withdrawal symptoms of cannabis, um, irritability, anxiety, and so forth. Um, whereas, but scraws can also produce a lot more severe withdrawal symptoms, including psychosis uh, and cardiovascular and respiratory problems. Uh, in addition to all of this, scraw users might also have worse treatment outcomes than recreational cannabis users. Uh, because there is significantly greater impairment in the executive function of scraw users, um, which includes the inhibitory control mechanisms, long-term memory, and working memory. Um, this has been seen in uh, studies on alcohol addiction, um, where they've seen decreased, um, worse treatment outcomes for those with greater impairment in the executive function. Um, so just if there's anything you take away from this, uh, from this talk, just know that synthetic cannabinoids are not synthetic cannabis. Um, they're full agonists of the cannabinoid receptors. They're up to 500 times more potent than THC. They have a greater risk of adverse effects requiring emergency treatment. Uh, and their effects are more typical of psychostimulants, including being more addictive than cannabis. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we will go on to Steve Roll's talk first, and then we'll come back and at the end of that do all our questions because there's plenty in the Q&A. Thank you. I feel like I learned a lot. I thought I knew. <laughs> I thought I knew about synthetic animals. I was wrong. Anyway, thank you so much. And I'll hand over to Steve now. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Caitlin. That was, that was super interesting. Thanks, Anna. And um, David, so I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this works. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Share button. Is that working? Yeah, looks good. Cool. Let's click slideshow. Yay. Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about the responsible regulation of non medical cannabis. Uh, my name is Steve Rolls. I'm the senior policy analyst for Transform Drug Policy Foundation which is a UK-based uh, policy and advocacy group um, focusing on alternatives to the war on drugs. So we've, we've spent the last 20, 25 years looking at developing models for um, regulated markets, alternatives to the criminal markets we have now for cannabis and other drugs, but obviously I'm just gonna be focusing on cannabis today. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we also have a book out. This, uh, this is actually the third edition of um, our book, How to Regulate Cannabis Practical Guide. It's published on the 19th of April. Um, the first edition came out in 2012 when nobody had uh, legalized cannabis. Um, now there's multiple countries have legalized cannabis and uh, as I'm gonna talk about in a moment. Um, the book's available to buy in print, but it's also gonna be available um, to download as a free PDF. So you don't have to buy it if you don't want to. Um, and uh, as David's left the room, I can officially say that it's better than uh, David's book on cannabis. And we've done a randomized control trial to establish that. So that is some drug science. Um, that's a joke, by the way. Uh, so just looking at some global reforms around the world. Um, as I said, back in 2012, nobody had legalized uh, and regulated cannabis. And now uh, in, in 2012-13, we had Washington and Colorado, and then Uruguay became the first nation state. Um, 2018, Canada, uh, Mexico a couple of years ago, following a constitutional court case, and now 18, 18 states in the US. So pretty much the whole of um, 
North America now, uh, especially if um, federal legalization happens and it's looking fairly likely, perhaps not in this government, but, but possibly. Um, we'll have the whole of North America. So you'll be able to walk from kind of almost from the Arctic Circle to the equator, almost, um, without leaving a, a legal cannabis jurisdiction. Um, and elsewhere in the world, uh, we've seen uh, religious and medical use legalized in uh, Jamaica. We've seen a, another constitutional court case, a bit like in Mexico, striking down cannabis prohibition in South Africa. Um, they haven't actually replaced that with uh, a regulatory system yet, but it's it's happening. And then there's this wave of reforms happening across um, Europe at the moment. Luxembourg was one of the first to announce a tiny little country, um, you know, quite a surprising one, kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, I, I just thought it was lots of people living in castles eating cake, but um, apparently not. They're legalizing cannabis, but uh, they, their one is slightly uh, ambiguous what they're doing. At the moment, it looks like they're just going to go for a home grow model, although they initially announced they would have a, a regulated retail market. Germany, hugely significant, announced uh, very recently. Um, significant just because of their geopolitical heft, their, their power within the EU and on the global stage. Um, it's really going to change the EU, um, the European cannabis debate when Germany goes, which will probably not be until about 2024. But it is announced and it's now in train. Switzerland, um, they're having a series of pilots on a city level basis. The Netherlands, uh, obviously, uh, have had coffee shops since, since the mid 70s. Um, but are now finally having uh, legal regulated supply to the coffee shops. It hasn't happened yet, but th this is also in train it's in its final stages through the, um, the, the Dutch parliament. And Malta, another one, a bit like Luxembourg, rather surprisingly, kind of came out of nowhere and have actually become the first EU country to properly legalise cannabis. And they that, that law passed a few weeks ago, and they are legalising uh, personal possession, homegrown for personal use, and not-for-profit cooperatives. Um, so they're not having a commercial retail market, but that you will be able to have legal access either through home growing or by joining one of these membership clubs. So we now have in a really relatively short space of time from a, from a standing start, we now have almost half a billion people live in legal cannabis jurisdictions. So clearly there's an important debate to be had about what legal regulation actually looks like. In terms of what legal regulation actually means, what it actually is, um, the, the, the concept of regulation, people often talk about legalization. Legalization is actually just a process of something illegal becoming legal. Regulation is the destination of that process. Um, and regulation essentially concerns itself with the concept of risk management. You identify risks and then you deploy various policy tools to try and minimize, minimize or moderate those risks. Arguably also maximize benefits, but regulation, you know, classically, it's, it's essentially focusing on risk management. Um, and it's very much the norm uh, it, and regulation of risky products and behaviours is it's a key function of government. It's very much the norm in terms of, you know, risky risks that we face every day, whether it's with food or with cars or with electronic devices or with, you know, flame retardant foam in sofas. It's, this is one of the key things that governments do, um, but not for a certain group of illegal drugs. Obviously, they do do it for uh, legal drugs, and we'll come back to that. The motive, obviously, or should be public good rather than private profit. Um, clearly, regulation models for, for cannabis or other drugs are shaped by the particular risks and the particular environment. There's not a one size fits all model, even for uh, cannabis, because there's a range of different cannabis products, obviously, and they will be regulated in different ways. It's important to be clear that activities outside of um, the regulatory framework will remain prohibited, just as they do for alcohol and tobacco. You can't sell vodka to children. Uh, you can't sell alcohol over certain strength. You can't sell alcohol from certain premises. You have to have a license. So you, these are this is a concept that we're all familiar with. And it's also just an important to make a distinction between regulation and free markets. Some some people imagine when you when you legalize cannabis that it, you could just do whatever you like. Clearly, that's not the case. Regulation establishes the parameters for a, a, uh, a formal retail market. What we regulate, again, this is kind of obvious, really, but it's worth restating uh, that regulation applies to all elements of the market, the production and transit uh, of cannabis, the products themselves in terms of their dosage, preparation, price, the packaging, the vendors, who is, a, who is selling this, what are the licensing or training requirements, outlets where is it sold from 
What's their location, their appearance, their hours of opening? Do we allow online sales, for example, and how would they be regulated? Issues around marketing. Do we allow advertising and branding and promotions? Um, and of course, um, access to the market, the buyers and users, who has access? Most obviously, that will be with age controls. So for each of these things, there's actually a significant body of expertise that's been developed from alcohol policy, from tobacco policy, from pharmaceutical drug regulation, and to a certain extent from other uh, risky behaviours such as gambling or sex work or dangerous sports and so on. So we've actually, we're actually pretty good at this stuff. We just need to apply that knowledge to cannabis in ways that we haven't done um, historically until very recently. And in terms of what lessons come from uh, all of that thinking, um, I just want to run through five key lessons here. The first one is we need to decide what we want that policy, that regulation policy to achieve. We need to uh, agree our policy aims. Those aims shouldn't be that controversial, I don't think. It's about protecting public health. It's about reducing crime and social harms. It's about protecting vulnerable uh, populations in particular. It's about protecting uh, human rights. It's about in ensuring social justice um, and uh, ensuring uh, environmental sustainability. So these things shouldn't be that difficult, um, but for each of them, we need to establish meaningful and robust indicators for measuring delivery of those agreed aims. And we need to build a robust evaluation framework into the system from the start, because one of the historical problems with cannabis policy is it's not been well evaluated. And that's why we've had the failings um, that David uh, alluded to have, have been perpetuated for, for decade after decade, decade, generation after generation. Obviously, we need to get the balance right. Um, different stakeholders may have different priorities. I talked about some of those goals of policy. Different people may prioritise them in different ways. And some different policy outcomes can be in conflict with each other. An example of that, for example, is um, some people would say we need to keep the price of cannabis uh, high to dissuade people from consuming too much. Other people would say, well, if we keep the price too high, uh, you will encourage an illegal market. And actually, we need to keep the price low. And we've seen that debate play out with, for example, with um, taxation on tobacco. So compromises will be necessary. There's no perfect outcomes. Not everybody is going to get everything they want. Um, there are some difficult questions to tease out here and diff difficult compromises to be made. We need to learn the lessons from alcohol and tobacco. Um, clearly, commercialization will tend to lead to weak regulation because profit is prioritized over public health. Um, and that can lead to um, avoidable social and health harms, as we've seen so clearly with alcohol and tobacco policy historically. But we do know how we do now have a good understanding of what best practice looks like for alcohol and tobacco regulation, even if we don't always do it. We, I think we've done a lot better with tobacco in recent years than we have with alcohol. Um, but we, you know, we need to take those lessons and bring them into um, cannabis policy. And I think specifically we need to explore models that mitigate the risks of over commercialization, in particular the risks of corporate capture and monopolization. Some of those things we are already beginning to see in North American cannabis markets. And you can actually see with some of the debates that are playing out in Europe and some of the models that are emerging like Malta, for example, which is home growing and non-profit cooperatives only. Um, those are a reaction to, to some of the problems of over commercialization that have emerged um, in uh, North America. So these are things we need to be mindful of. We need to build social justice principles into our policy frameworks from the outset. We need to make sure that regulation doesn't just reproduce the inequities of prohibition. Um, we need to make sure that some of the benefits of regulation in terms of the profits from those businesses and the economic activity that might result from it is directed towards repairing some of the harms that the drug war has caused, um, particularly the disproportionate impact of uh, drug law enforcement on marginalized and vulnerable communities. And some of the cannabis social equity programs that have emerged in some US states, such as Massachusetts, and now uh, in New York and New Jersey, show that this is possible. It's an evolving field, but I think a very important one. And a key part of that is the involvement of impacted communities in policy design. So that's both people who use cannabis and people who have been impacted by or harmed by um, failed and counterproductive, counter, counterproductive cannabis policies. Um, fifth and final lesson is really that, that there is no one size all, uh, one size fits all model. 
different products are associated with different risks and require different regulation. You wouldn't regulate vapes the same as you would regulate herbal or edibles or oils or whatever else, topicals or all the other different types of cannabis products. They all have their own regulatory challenges and need to be dealt with in different ways to address their particular sets of risks uh, and benefits. Clearly, the more risky products um, justify a, a greater level of market intervention. So I'm talking about higher potency uh, products or products that would potentially be used in more risky ways. But we do have this menu of regulatory tools to choose from. And it's that detail on the regulation models where the debate really needs to focus now. It's not should we regulate cannabis, it's how do we do it in the right way. I think there's a general consensus that the current policy doesn't work, but there's less of a consensus about what the post-drug war um, framework should exactly look like. And that's where the debate is now and needs to be. Um, this graph tries to capture some of the ideas that Transform's promoted. So on the uh, y-axis is social and health harms rising up, uh, up the y-axis and across the x-axis is a range of different um, approaches to cannabis uh, regulation from kind of a hardcore war on drugs on the left over to sort of uh, libertarian free markets over on the right. And the general picture here is that the, the, the low point in that U-curve where social and health harms are minimised lies somewhere between those poles. Cannabis is legalised, possession is and people who use it are decriminalised, but you have strict legal, a strictly legally regulated market. What you don't want is for um, cannabis policy to move from a war on drugs past that point and then go barreling over to the right towards um, commercial promotion so that some of the harms associated that we've seen in the past with alcohol and tobacco are then replicated. But we've also to a certain degree seen alcohol and tobacco policy moving towards that um, optimal center point as well, albeit from a different starting point. Although at either extreme, they do share um, the idea that uh, you have minimal regulation, whether it's under a, 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 legal, a poorly regulated legal market or a completely unregulated illegal market. And just in case you're thinking that that, that graph is completely made up, which obviously it is, because it's just trying to conceive of a, of a, a visual representation of a concept. We did actually do a study, uh, drug science led a study, and the, the title of the paper is over there on the right, a new approach to formulating and appraising drug policy, a multi-criterion decision analysis applied to alcohol and cannabis regulation, where we tried to put some numbers to um, these different models, free market, state control model, decriminalization, um, and absolute prohibition. Um, and the state control model, which is kind of the, uh, the one in the middle of that U-curve, so the, the, it does come out the best. So it scores highest on each of those impacts. Um, so this, this, this graph is kind of an upside down version of this one. If you imagine turning that over, you, you, you get this. So we did actually try to put some numbers to, to that. So it's not completely uh, made up. And it's Roggerberg et al. if you want to search for it. And it's on the drug science website as well. Um, just to illustrate some of the dangers here, this is cannabis packaging, which I think is more appropriate and sensible. Um, that's cannabis packaging sold from pharmacies in the legal model uh, in Uruguay on the left. Um, that's cannab um, cannabis packaging requirements in Canada. Um, and just to say Transform were actively involved in helping design the policies in, in both of those countries. Um, and you can read more about all that in the, in the book I was talking about earlier. Um, this is some stuff from some of the less uh, well-regulated models in the US, which concern, I mean, we've got these kind of uh, ridiculously branded uh, cannabis infused drinks. This Cannabumps thing is cannabis THC powder, um, sort of marketed like cocaine that, you're, that you snort with a little spoon, it's ridiculous. Um, and, uh, and on the right, we can see Mike Tyson's celebrity branded Mike Bites, cannabis infused edibles, in the shape of an ear with a bite taken out of it. Kind of everything that you would, I mean, it's kind of funny in a way, but it's also obnoxious in so many ways. I mean, celebrity branding is ridiculous. The idea that you celebrate male violence is obviously offensive. And the idea that you have cannabis infused things that look like child sweets is also from a public health point of view, kind of ridiculous. So just some conclusions. It's really important to get the balance right if the system's too restrictive, the problems of a criminal market will continue. If the system uh, is not restrictive enough, there's a risk of increased use and related health harms. 
um, for practical and political reasons, starting with a more restrictive system or a non-profit state monopoly type system or non-profit co-op system uh, with home growing is probably sensible. We need to move forward in cautious incremental steps following the evidence. Close scrutiny of evaluation on a range of key performance indicators is hugely important. We're talking about science and you can apply science to policy as well as to uh, pharmacology. And we also need to be honest that, that legalization regulation is not a silver bullet. It's about taking back control of the market as a way to reduce harms associated with prohibition. It doesn't eliminate all the harms associated with cannabis use per se. Maybe it would help us maximize some of the benefits, however. Um, and just finally, discussions also needed on other drugs. It's not just about cannabis. Let's not get too kind of cannabis exceptionalist about this. We need to legalize and regulate all drugs. The same, uh, the same uh, arguments apply. Whatever your starting point is from a risk perspective, it's always increased uh, under prohibition and it will always be decreased under a responsible public health led regulatory system. Um, and there's the book. Do go and download it. Uh, it's going to be online in about uh, a couple of weeks and you can download the second edition now, but I'd suggest wait for the third one. Thanks so much. I'll stop there. I've probably gone on too long already. No, that was perfect timing. Thank you so much. I've never seen those um, edible ears before. That was, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> somewhat disturbing. But that's <laughs> Um, okay, so we'll go on to uh, our questions now. Um, so I've got a mix for both you, uh, Steve and Caitlin, and I'll, I'll probably direct them at you. But if either of you wants to jump on, um, please do. Um, so Caitlin, I think it would be interesting just to talk, because I think in the chat there's a bit of confusion about kind of what synthetic cannabinoids are used for and kind of who's using them for. Um, so I think if you could kind of elaborate on that, that would be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So they were originally used because they were a legal alternative to uh, cannabis or, or other drugs. Um, of course, now in the UK, because of the Psychoactive Substance Act, uh, which was enacted in 2016, um, they are all illegal. Um, although not quite as, as, bad, as badly as if it's in the Misuse Drugs Act. Um, but um, now that they're illegal, um, they're mainly only seen in use within prison populations or rough sleeping communities. Um, and this is largely because of the benefits that uh, straws have uh, in terms of they're much harder to detect. They're because they're so potent, they're really uh, easy to uh, smuggle into prisons. Um, we've had a lot of infused mail going in, um, infused clothing and all that, um, which is what I work on here with the Scottish prisons. Um, and, uh, and they tend to be very cheap as well. There's also been reports of just, they're really available, like in Manchester, um, if you're on the streets, it's just, it's there, it's just so prevalent. Um, but they, they do, of course, give psychoactive, positive psychoactive effects, um, although it has been said that they have kind of a harsh high. Um, so most people prefer to use cannabis um, unless they have another reason not to, such as they're being monitored for drug use and so on. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, Caitlin, I think it's kind of interesting um, on, on Spice that what you were saying, that they, they emerged as a, a legal alternative to prohibition. I mean, it do, I mean, I don't know whether you want to get into the policy dimension here, but it always struck me that that, that to a significant extent, they were a creation of prohibition, or at least not not creation of, but they, certainly that market was fueled by prohibition. And it's interesting if you go to somewhere like the Netherlands, where cannabis has been at least quasi legal for, for decades, a market for scars never emerged, certainly not to the extent that it has um, in the UK and, and the US and elsewhere. Certainly not, I don't think, in the general population, but I think you'll probably see that it might be uh, within the prisons and stuff where I don't think you can, I don't think they allow cannabis within the prisons in the Netherlands, um, although I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, it really is because of, because of the prohibition. I mean, you'll see the same thing with opioids, uh, with the fentanyl emerging. Um, you know, these are all new psychoactive substances, all of which have emerged because of uh, prohibition on uh, the traditional drugs that people actually want to use. <laughs> and has anyone, sorry, I'm, uh, Anna, I'm just barging in with my own questions. No, for Caitlin. Great. Has, has, has anyone great. looked at using uh, 
conventional cannabis, natural cannabis, whatever you want to call it, as a sort of harm reduction substitute for people who are dependent on scrubs? Um, yeah. So there have been, uh, it has been suggested to prison officials that you should just stop testing for cannabis and mandatory drug testing because most users say they would much rather be using cannabis. Prison staff have said it's so much easier if they're using cannabis because they just kind of mellow out and go take a nap or something, um, whereas gras make them very aggressive. Um, so it has been suggested to like, maybe you should just let them use the cannabis and like make our lives easier. Um, I know there were some prison guards in uh, England that were trying to at least get a trial uh, trial basis within a few of the prisons of providing some cannabis. Um, but that is as far as it's gone so far. I don't think it, I don't know if it's actually been approved or not, but it's certainly something that everybody who's working, all the researchers and stuff in this area are like, just let them use cannabis. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Cool. Thank you. It's far, far too sensible a solution. They'll never go for it. It makes too much sense to do that. Yeah. Okay, good. So I think we'll then just direct um, one question to you, Steve. Again, Caitlin, feel free to uh, jump on if you have any thoughts. Um, but there's a question. Oh, I'm losing. Sort of about. Uh, what do you think, is there a point where cannabis could be, oh no, I've got, <laughs> it's definitely Anna, I'm me. losing you a little bit. Okay, yeah, so I'm. Yeah, is, I've just, nightmare. So got... <laughs> I'm going to keep my camera off for the minute. Can you hear me um, now? Yep, that's fine, I can hear you. Yeah, so just whether there's a point where cannabis could be overregulated, um, and also is there any data emerging from kind of uh, countries where we're sort of seeing regulated, but also sort of not really regulated adult use of, of cannabis? Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. I, I think it's a really good point, and it was I kind of alluded to that in my concluding slide. I don't know whether um, maybe the question came up there before. Um, that you can overregulate things. I mean, you know, there there is a there is a risk that if you if you if if the market is too restrictive, people won't use it. You know, if you if you add an enormous tax price uh, tax burden and the and it's and it's three times as expensive as the cannabis you buy on the streets, people will still use the illegal market. Or you know, if you make it if if you say you can only buy one gram a month or something, and people want to use five grams a month. It, that, that you yeah obviously you can overregulate them so you have to get the balance right between kind of putting some barriers to access to sort of uh, dissuade or moderate use but not putting too many that you um, in, in, encourage an illegal market and it comes back to that issue of balance you know what what is what is our priority is it a public health priority or is it a getting rid of the illegal market priority or is it a bit of both clearly it, it's a bit of both but we have to make that balance. But if we, if we are the reg, if you know, if, if we have legal regulation, we have a responsible public health agency making those decisions, we can do that. We can make those choices uh, as a democratic society based on the evidence rather than defaulting everything to an illegal market. So um, there's no easy answer to that. But yes, you certainly could overregulate, and I don't think we should. I think it's better to start with a strictly regulated model and then roll it back as a sort of precautionary approach rather than start with a very lib uh, sort of completely open liberal market where there's no restrictions at all. Everything goes a bit haywire. And then you have to rein it in, which is basically what's happened with alcohol and tobacco historically. And it's very, very difficult, particularly when you've got an entrenched industry that has enormous lobbying and corporate power as alcohol and tobacco have. So it's taken us it's taken us gen a generation really to, to rein in big tobacco. Um, and we still haven't done it with alcohol. You know, we still do have alcohol brands sponsoring our Olympic teams. You know, Strongbow Cider sponsored the, the, the Rio Olympic team, the British Olympic team, Strongbow Cider, not, not even nice cider. Um, <laughs> with, with apologies to Strongbow and cider drinkers. <laughs> um, so, so yes, so there, there, there are there are real dangers. You can go far, too far one way and too far the other. And I hope that U curve kind of describes where we think we need to be. 
um, at least as a starting point, because there's a lot we don't know about how the market would, would change and how changes in the market would impact on behaviours um, and risks. So there's a, there's a learning curve here. And it's interesting, actually, that we, the fact that we've got all these different models around the world, the kind of more strictly regulated state sort of pharmacy sales model in Uruguay versus the more the sort of more alcohol commercial models in places like Colorado, we can see how they're working and, and, we, can, and, and we can learn from that. So as, as the UK comes to that, and we will get there eventually, and these European countries come to it, we can look at those experiences um, and learn from it and then apply that kind of policy science that has been absent from drug policy um, for so long. Brilliant. I realise I'm just a floating, floating voice now. I'll see if I can sort that out a bit. I think we will move on to our next session, but thank you so much, both of you, for uh, answering those questions and your brilliant talks. Um, there's still plenty of them that I did not get through in the um, Q&A, so if you want to type some answers, please feel free. Will do. Thanks, Alana. Thank you. Cheers, Caitlin. Lovely. So now we'll be doing, I'm sorry about being a floating voice, everyone. I just think it's safer for the moment, but I might try and be brave in a bit and see if I can reappear. Um, but we'll just move on to our next uh, section, which is cannabis and technology. So we'll be hearing from three speakers again. It will be Greg Steinberg, Dr. Kelly Seaman and Franzi Katterback. Yeah. Fantastic. And we can hear me OK. Well, thank you very much for joining me tonight. I'm uh, Dr. Callie Seaman from Aqua Labs and MedCan Support. Um, I am also a medical cannabis patient as well and a scientist working with licensed cultivation facilities, one which is a beautiful picture here of all these plants. And we are looking at the production of secondary metabolites in plants. And today I'm going to actually talk about testing of uh, cannabis and certificates of analysis and why it's important and the kind of different methodologies that's involved for each kind of component of that. So the first question is, why do we actually need to do testing of the plants? Well, one of the first things is plant disease testing. The plants quite often will suffer from diseases such as powdery mildew, and we can use analytical, analytical testing in order to do this to find out when the plant is very young if there is a disease which could be spread to other plants. And the second is for human consumption safety. Now, it's important that we know that what we're taking, as quite often uh, drugs aren't actually dangerous. It's not knowing what we're taking that is the problem. So what concentration something may be or what is actually present in what we are uh, consuming. So we can split them into these four different categories. We've got the active ingredients and that's the potency and the presence and generally we're looking at cannabinoids and terpenes. These are what of great, greatest interest that are active ingredients. We then got the safety aspect, and that includes microbial, microtoxins, heavy metals, pesticides, and residual solvents. Now, things like residual solvents will come from extracted products as opposed to the flower itself, and pesticides can be present on particular flowers as well. But we'll, we'll cover all of these just in a moment. And then we've got the nutritional value, which isn't really reported when it comes to uh, recreational or uh, to do with uh, medicinal cannabis or prescription cannabis. This is more on uh, health food products, such as the amino acids. So you don't really get many reports about this, but this tends to be on the hemp seed oils, the, uh, your seeds as well. So you know what the nutritional content is. Then there's the authenticity of the product. And this is about the, the actual strain of it. And there's, there's a lot of work starting to emerge in the US around this, but this is not a routine uh, test that's performed. Really the routine ones are the active ingredients and the safety. So we've got two kind of categories here. We've got the qualitative testing, which is basically telling you what is present there, but it doesn't really tell you much about the concentration or how much is there. So you, it, it makes it harder for you to be able to dose or know how much of a particular product to take. That's where you've got quantitative analysis. This tends to be uh, a lot more longer uh, it takes a lot more work and preparation, but it will tell you exactly how much of the active ingredient is present and the, well, basically the concentration of it. So those are the two forms. And as I say, qualitative seems to be a lot quicker, but only tells us what's there and what isn't there. Quantitative tells us how much is there and tends to take a lot longer. 
That quantitative analysis will also require what's known as standards. And these are solutions of known concentration and a calibration is usually created when using the instrument. Now, this can be an actual downfall of these kind of methodologies because if the um, standards which are used, those solutions of known concentration have been mixed up and then placed into the fridge and are a little bit older, these can give results which aren't as accurate. And this is why it's important when using an accredited lab to ask the kind of these kinds of questions of how often do they calibrate their instruments. So let's start off with the microbial side of things. This is a safety aspect. And so with plants, there are a number of different um, fungus, a uh, number of different bacteria that are problematic and cause reductions in yields from powdery mildew to botrytis. Uh, these are, this is a grey mold which grows on the flower and actually reduce down the amount of oil that the plant is producing and makes it not consumable. Then we've got viruses like hops latent viroid which is, um, is passed from plant to plant and causes an absolute massive reduction in the yield and could cause problems with different um, different profiles and can actually actually change the profile of the, the plant itself. We've then got the human pathogens, such as E. coli, Salmonella, and Aspergillus. Now, Aspergillus is actually an endophyte that lives between the cells of the plant and doesn't do anything to plant and doesn't cause any problems. But if it is actually inhaled by a consumer through smoking, can cause lung problems. And there's a number of different methodology that can be used here. There's the old school culture plate methodology which uses an agar plate and is plated out and then the culture is grown to identify but more modern pieces of equipment which we're probably quite familiar with from these last two years is the polymerase, polymerase chain reaction um, and this is a, a DNA sequencing methodology which actually looks uh, it actually takes a, a sample of the product, uh, it digests it down and then you extract the DNA to actually see if something is present. Um, this could be done, as I say, with things like Aspergillus and Salmonella, uh, and it, that can also be quantified by using a uh, quantitative polymerase chain reaction. Then we've got the microtoxins. Now, these are substances produced by uh, fungus which are left behind and cause food spoilages, and there's a number of different ones we mentioned there. Now, these use a different kind of methodology in order to actually detect them. They use something called liquid chromatography, which it's a separation technique where the solution is passed through a column and the, the different analytes that are looked for are separated out within this column and then is detected by a mass spectrometer and there's other methodologies such as amino affinity chromatography again another separation technique and then this high performance liquid chromatography which is much more sensitive than the bog standard liquid chromatography so then we'll move on to heavy metals, we're staying with the safety aspect of it. But cannabis is this amazing phytoremediation. What it can do is it could take up a lot of metals out of soil or within the media that it's being grown in and then accumulate them within the actual flowers and the oils of the plant. And once of a particular uh, concern, arsenic, cadmium, lead and mercury. Nickel and zinc are actually needed by the plant, but in very, very tiny quantities. But if the soil that the plant has been grown in or the media that it's been grown in have got high concentration of these, the plants can take them up and accumulate these. Now, in order to actually detect these, we need instruments called uh, inductive coupled plasma mass spectrometers. And these are very, very expensive pieces of equipment and require uh, expensive, uh, gases such as argon in order to perform the analysis, but they're very, very sensitive. A much cheaper methodology is the inductive coupled plasma emission spectroscopy, which is not quite as sensitive, but isn't as expensive to run. But all the samples must first be digested, again, taking more time up in order to do this. Uh, both of these methodologies will tell us any of the other metals that are present as well. So it's also very good when we're looking at plants to look at the nutritional um, value of the plant itself and to see the status of it if you are feeding it correctly. 
So the next one is the active ingredients that we're probably very familiar with. Well, there's a number of different of these. So the first of them, we'll look at the cannabinoids. And as you'll probably know, I think the last count, there was 144. Now, we can't analyze all 144. It would take far too long and far too many standard solutions that are needed with these known concentrations of each of these analytes. But the ones that are actually listed here are the most common ones that the laboratories will look for. Um, if you've also noticed there, I've mentioned Delta-8 um, THC as well, which came up in the questions earlier. And this is one that I feel that we really do need to be monitoring more because it, it's kind of the new kid on the block. Block, and there's been a lot of interest in this. So I'd like to see more method development really around that and that being reported. Again, methodology uses a, a number of different um, methodology that all vary in accuracy and specificity as well. The, ex the oil must first be extracted, but I mentioned there there's infrared spectroscopy, which only looks for THC and CBD. It doesn't look for any of these other cannabinoids which are mentioned here. For, to look for these, you'll need something like high performance liquid chromatography using the mass spectrometer, which you can see this uh, actual spe spectra, spectra at the bottom here separates out the different cannabinoids. We've also got uh, a, a new technique such as nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Again, that will only do a select few cannabinoids, usually THC and CBD, and is only really good for being able to say if it's a high THC or a low, uh, a high CBD um, sample, as opposed to being able to tell you the full profile that's been um, within the product itself. So with them, we've got the terpenes. Now I've, I've not listed all the terpenes or I would just simply wouldn't have had enough room on the page in order to do that. But again, the oil must first be extracted. And then we use a technique called gas chromatography because these actual compounds are a lot more volatile and within liquid chromatography, it's harder to detect these. Gas chromatography will look at uh, vapors that are being produced within the instrument and then it goes into the mass spectrometer to actually detect those. So we've got residual solvents. And as I mentioned earlier, residual solvents will only really need to be tested within extracted products. So stuff like ethanol or pentane can be left behind um, with these particular concentrated products. And again, because these are solvents and are quite volatile, we'll use a technique called gas chromatography in order to be able to uh, detect these and measure the quantity of these. Pesticides are also of great um, concern as well because a number of cultivators will use these to treat uh, pests that may come into their facility, such as thrips, such as spider mites. Um, you've got powdery mildew as well. And then pesticides could be used to actually keep the numbers of these down and allow crops to be able to finish to the end of their life cycle without a reduction in yield. Now there's two different methodology we can use here, again the liquid chromatography and the gas chromatography, and it's very dependent on the substance which you're looking for. As I say, the nutritional side isn't what you would call a routinely done um, methodology within uh, cannabis labs at the moment, but a lot of people will want to know the nutritional content if they're using it as a supplement or if they're using it in order to as part of their diet um, so that they, they understand exactly what they're intaking. So here's an example of a, a, a typical certificate of analysis that you'll see. And it, it, as you can see, the pesticide list goes on and on and on and on. There's, I think there's over uh, 100 in that particular list. But we often, often start off with um, stating the, the date that it was actually analysed and the laboratory it was done in, the, the analyst who performed this, and the actual limits of detection of each of those um, methodologies of testing and usually it will state the methodology that's used as well and um, giving you a, a general overview of that. Well thank you very much for listening that was everything um, I've covered today on testing in cannabis. I hope it all made sense and if you've got any questions please put them into the questions below. Perfect thank you so much and thank you for 
jumping in just then that was really helpful I'm learning so much this evening <laughs> sort of writing questions down as I go um brilliant so with that we will move uh, to Greg's talk if he's if he's happy and we've got the share uh, sorted out not at all please do keep putting um, questions into the chat uh, into the Q&A fantastic okay I think I have it all figured out so hopefully uh, hopefully you can see the screen now yeah fantastic okay so uh, uh, thanks for taking a couple of minutes and I'm just going to share with you uh, our thoughts on uh, personalized cannabis by really taking a look at our own individual uh, DNA makeup and our profile and uh, providing devices that allow for uh, dosing based on specific dosing recommendations uh, coming off of our genetic profile. So uh, underneath our platform, we have uh, two core pieces of technology. Uh, on the left, you'll see a number of uh, two different vaping devices, which I'll talk about later. These are uh, vaporizers, not, not combustion. Uh, and on the right, uh, our genetic testing kit, uh, which we have a couple of patents pending on in cannabis and, and one in the psychedelic space. And we're focusing on three core areas right now, uh, pain, anxiety, and sleep with, um, with wellness and women's uh, health uh, coming up uh, in the not too distant future. And uh, the, uh, the logging into the kit, uh, the information from the, that comes off the genetic testing kit together with these uh, different vaping devices are all tied into a mobile app. So they're smart devices. Uh, that allow for this controlled uh, personal wellness ability uh, to track uh, both how much we're dosing at an individual given point of time, um, as well as uh, ongoing tracking of, of each of our medical conditions. Um, the uh, viewpoint of why we look at pain, anxiety, and insomnia to start with when there's a huge amount of, of uh, research and a body of knowledge out there that we draw from in terms of clinical trials and uh, peer-reviewed articles. Uh, but also just the sheer numbers. Uh, these are US-based numbers, uh, which obviously are significant. And uh, based on what we look at uh, in the UK as an example, or the EU, if we take a, these, these as a percentage of population in the US, uh, apply those same percentages against population in, uh, in the UK or the EU, we would see uh, similar types of population counts. Uh, this is a study that was conducted uh, last year uh, in North America. Uh, and if you take a look at the far right, uh, medical cannabis users, truly medical cannabis users, uh, four of the five top uh, areas identified in terms of usage were around pain, anxiety, and insomnia. And uh, in Canada and the US where recreational adult use is legal, uh, these respondents, four of the five, again, uh, relative to pain, anxiety, and insomnia. Uh, so back to why, why we're focused in these areas. Uh, in the center graph, uh, the blue bars show percentages of individuals who have, who have transitioned from some, but not all of their traditional prescription medicine uh, over to cannabis utilization as part of their, their uh, medical regime. And the white bars underneath it are percentages of individuals who have moved 100% off of traditional uh, prescription medicine to 100% cannabis regime to handle each of these medical conditions identified. Again, a number there that would fall within the anxiety, insomnia, and, and pain categories. There's been a little bit talked about uh, so far today on the, on the endocannabinoid system. Uh, so I won't really dive too much into that. Uh, we're looking at the ability to manage stress, which uh, has an impact obviously on, uh, on pain, anxiety, and insomnia, and, and these core conditions specifically and take the teeter-totter that, that we all live on on an individual basis, on a daily basis, uh, and sort of even that out. Uh, looking at CBD as a, as a specific for a second, uh, as we look at CBD and THC specifically right now, uh, you can see these six core receptors, uh, which we're looking at, uh, where there's interaction between this chemical compound of CBD uh, and the impact that it has on various cells, organs, brain, Etc. Uh, again, a number of them managing pain, anxiety, and, and insomnia. And what we're trying to solve for is getting rid of, rid of this trial and error 
uh, that most patients live in. Uh, this was a study done a little while ago, but nearly half of those trying to uh, treat for insomnia, pain, and anxiety were using a trial and error method that uh, uh, you know, takes a long time to try and figure out how to get it dialed in, if, if at all, and certainly has an economic impact to it. Uh, and I would suggest and prosper that uh, this 48% is probably a much higher number. Most of us don't have the patience to, uh, to wait for three or six months to, to try and figure something out, especially if we have no response or poor response. Uh, and so with this, uh, with the solution that we're bringing that's in the market in the US uh, on the DNA kit, uh, we're solving for the solution of ask, answering the question, what is the right dosage for me? And looking at genetic variants to, uh, to uh, make that prognosis. Uh, so that for an individual patient uh, or for a doctor, practitioner, a clinician that's working with a patient to be able to use the genetic testing kit as a baseline, as a diagnostic tool uh, to be able to uh, work with that individual patient to look at daily dosing requirements of CBD and THC uh, for pain, anxiety, and insomnia. Uh, that's one of the solutions that we're bringing to market, which is the DNA kit. Uh, the other is the, uh, the vaping devices, uh, which are already also ready to commercialize into the market in the States, uh, one of which has Health Canada approval as a medical device. Uh, and so that an individual patient then can answer the question, okay, great that uh, the kit told me I need 16.2 milligrams of CBD and 0.7 milligrams of THC a day to handle my insomnia, but I can't find that uh, in a pharmacy anywhere uh, or in a dispensary anywhere, wherever I can, can legally buy. So what, what do I do? And so the vaping devices, which are tied to, uh, tied, tied to a smartphone, allow you to plug into the app on your phone, that specific dosing recommendation for C, CBD and THC, which then talks to the device and then doses that amount specifically for, uh, for that patient. Uh, and so just uh, you know, a little bit of information on the anecdotal of what doesn't work, Body weight is, is often used as, as a proxy for, for uh, dosing recommendations, lower weight, lower dose, uh, higher weight, higher dose. Uh, this one I'm just missing, but goes from about uh, 47 uh, kilograms on the, low, on the left-hand side to about 125 kilograms per person on the, on the right-hand side, uh, where you can see there's really very little correlation, if at all between uh, weight and how much uh, CBD and THC a person should be taking on a daily basis. Age is sometimes used also as a corollary. And here again, you can see no correlation between age. This goes from 16 uh, on the uh, left-hand side up to 80 on the right-hand side. Uh, no correlation between age and uh, how much CBD and THC an individual should be taking. So with the, with the uh, genetic uh, testing and the meter dosing devices that we have, we're bringing an end-to-end -end solution to the marketplace. Uh, DNA sequencing through the kit uh, to make personalized recommendations on a daily basis. THC and CBD right now expanding into other cannabinoids uh, as we move forward. Uh, generating uh, proprietary formulations, obviously different for sleep than for pain that can that get put into our devices. Uh, metered on a specific basis for that individual patient, and then the app on your phone, allowing for ongoing monitoring, tracking, and data data aggregation. Uh, the, this data underneath uh, what we're what we're um, being able, able to utilize is uh, individual genetic data from a patient from the kit, uh, patient uses data coming from the dosing devices, and then uh, the feedback loop uh, through the app in terms of patient's response data. That allows us then to aggregate all of that data and then be able to work with uh, institutions, university, clinical research organizations, et cetera, to be able to uh, really dial in on specific health conditions, uh, medical conditions, diseases, et cetera, to identify what the appropriate dosing methodologies are for the individual patient, uh, work with insurance companies, work with product manufacturers, um, cultivators, et cetera, in terms of what products to bring to market for these individual indications. Uh, from the uh, DNA side, just to drive into that a little bit, on um, uh, our methodology there, we currently look at about 40 different variants across 20 different genes specific to CBD and THC and how they interact uh, with our bodies, both in terms of metabolism 
as well as in terms of these seven core receptors that you see on the, uh, on the, on the right, in terms of the transductional signaling that goes from those receptors to uh, our organs, our brain, our cells, our skin, et cetera. Uh, we plug that data into uh, our algorithm, which as I mentioned, is got a patent pending on it, uh, and uh, tie that together with, uh, with an, uh, some individual health data that's provided to us under uh, health privacy laws, uh, goes into, into the algorithm and allows us then to produce a, uh, a, de a dosing recommendation. Uh, again, back to you know, sort of why we're doing this. Here you can see these are 10 patients uh, that we have as an example. Uh, THC utilization on the left, CBD utilization on the right, uh, with um, the gray area being what was current, what those patients were currently using at the time that they took the DNA test uh, versus the recommendation that came back from the test. And here you can see uh, way over utilization of THC by each of these patients, way under utilization of CBD by, by each of these patients. Uh, here, back to the weight issue, just as a specific on pain, again, no correlation between weight and uh, recommended dosing of CBD and THC on a daily basis. Uh, we see the same thing in anxiety, uh, again, a different, uh, different patient count. Uh, CBD here, uh, way under utilization of CBD uh, for, uh, for these individuals and way over utilization of THC. In fact, the amount of THC needed, as you can see on the gray, is uh, very, very small amounts. Uh, insomnia, we see similar type of trends. Uh, current utilization of, uh, of CBD too much uh, versus our recommendation. And as you may expect, uh, the gray areas are THC. You can hardly see the recommended dosing on the bottom of the graph in terms of THC. Uh, to put it across all the spectrum of all the data that we have uh, through our patient count, uh, if you take a look at the chart at the bottom, uh, you can see uh, anxiety, insomnia, pain, and the min-max of, uh, of uh, the daily dosing of uh, from a milligram perspective uh, for patients, you know, 31 to 300, 5 to 50, 33 to 288. So the trial and uh, error method obviously is uh, very tough to dial and even for those who have the patience to work with it, um, the chances are it's uh, unlikely to actually hit the appropriate uh, dosing that, that an individual needs. You see the same thing on THC. Uh, again, these ranges are very, very wide, 0 0.06 to almost 11, uh, 0 0.01 to a little over two and 0.24 to uh, over 45 for pain. So for a practitioner, a doctor, a physician working with an individual patient, the ability to use the, the genetic testing to really create a baseline to work with that patient, get rid of the trial error, have a specific dosing requirement for that patient um, allows for much better patient care. It's a very simple uh, kit to use. Uh, it's a spit tube um, that, uh, that a patient spits into, gets mailed back to, uh, to a lab. Uh, CLIA certified, they do their uh, full length genetic sequencing that we do, and uh, we get that data and put it into our algorithm. The patient at a very high level uh, and the doctor get, uh, get this type of uh, uh, report information, uh, how many milligrams per day of CBD and THC to take for these three core medical conditions. We go deeper into four different sections in the report. Uh, that looks at each individual variance this, for this patient, four variants, uh, and how CBD and THC interact. We go deeper into the science and ultimately finish with a, uh, a final part of the report that uh, provides actually uh, information that cites uh, research that's being done, papers that have been written so that a geneticist or uh, a clinician can actually look at that body of knowledge and understand uh, why we're making the recommendations that we are. Once a patient has that specific recommendation of, of how much CBD and THC to take, uh, again, the question is, how do I do that? And so our solution is with these, uh, with these vaping devices for oil and for uh, flour-based products. Um, again, tied to a smartphone so uh, that uh, those rep dosing recommendations are plugged into the phone and then they feed that data and control how the, how the uh, dosing is done through the vaping device. We're also in the process of working on a liquid dispenser tincture type of, uh, of a product and a vaporizer like an atomizer uh, so that patients have a full full uh, ability for different type of delivery mechanisms. Uh, the app on the phone is something like you might expect to see. Um, you have your profile, 
uh, pick uh, various medical indications that you want to uh, put information on, the ability to track on an ongoing basis uh, that daily dosing, uh, how one felt prior to a dose, uh, after a dose, uh, et cetera. You know, on pain, it might be a, a quick feedback. On insomnia, it might be the night before and the morning after. And the ability to, to generate that, that uh, uh, data on an ongoing basis to be able to track and really control your, your wellness. We also have the ability for a patient uh, to be able to connect with their doctor through telemed platforms, uh, very similar to how an endocrinologist may work with their diabetes patient uh, that's wearing uh, wearable technology. Uh, won't go into the team very much, but just to give you a sense of uh, where we're coming from, uh, I'll focus on, uh, on Roy Wagner, um, one of my co-founding partners. Uh, Roy was a uh, geneticist in his postdoc days uh, in a uh, university in Washington in the States. Um, that was uh, one of the early, uh, the PI was one of the early Nobel Prize winners for genetics research on cancer. He then uh, left that for his own lab for a dozen or so years in, uh, in Oregon and then went into the private sector uh, working on uh, cancer and uh, genetics for, uh, for drug development, a company called Exalexis. Uh, part of that got spun out and acquired by Dow uh, Life Sciences. Uh, he went over there and ran their global new ventures program for, for about a half a dozen years before he came back onto the entrepreneurial side, which is uh, where we met and, and founded Greenway. Um, uh, one of the other members of the team on the far right, Dr. Liu. Uh, Alex was a postdoc in Rice Lab in, in Oregon and then followed him over to Exalexis, over to Dow and, and back into the entrepreneurial world and also one of the co-founders of Greenway DNA. So we've very deep genetic uh, talent uh, in the team, and uh, we're coming at it from a very academic uh, and rigorous uh, perspective. On our advisory board, uh, some of you may recognize a few of these people. Uh, Janice Knox, one of the leading uh, medical practitioners in the States in, in cannabis. Uh, Dr. Carrillo, one of the leading um, practitioners in Latin America and also tied into, uh, into U of T in Toronto. Uh, Dr. Wachowski is at the University of Madison uh, in Wisconsin. Um, with a specialty in pediatric uh, genetics. And Dr. Liu is uh, leading one of the leading molecular vision labs and genetic labs in the States, also out of Oregon, and uh, is where we do all our genetic work in, in the States. Uh, on uh, sort of people who are paying attention to us and involved with us in, in various ways, uh, Canaccord Genuity, which is the largest investment bank in the cannabis space in North America, also has a, an office in London, uh, Cresco, one of the leading uh, multi-state operators in the States. And as of this morning, uh, an announcement that they're buying um, Columbia Care, one of the other large MSOs in the States. So that'll make Cresco the largest uh, multi-state operator in the US. And Tilray, uh, which goes back and forth between number one and number two uh, largest LPs in Canada. Uh, and so I'll stop there. And uh, I know we've got some time for Q&A after the next uh, speaker. So uh, thank you very much for listening. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, that's amazing data. I didn't even know that that was possible. So that was very exciting. Uh, but yes, we will now uh, move on to our next speaker for our Q&A. Um, so that's Franzi Katterback. And I'm sorry if I have mispronounced any of that. <laughs> oh, fine. I'm just Franzi. Hi. <laughs> So let me try to start my screen share and please let me know if you see it. So should come up right now. So maybe can can you hear me and see my my presentation? Yep, all good. Perfect. So let me start the presentation mode. Some ah there we go. So yeah. Thanks, Greg, and uh, thanks, Kelly. It was very interesting uh, presentations from your side, and I think it's very interesting to hear like what products can be brought on the market, what quality standards have to be met. So I will now want to conclude this session by saying like, okay, now that we've realized what quality we have to meet and what product might be of interest, how do we produce cannabis, medical cannabis specifically commercially? And I will focus on the UK market here. My name is Franziska Katterbach. I'm the president of Chiron Life Sciences. By background, Chiron Life Sciences is a medical cannabis company with strong focus on Latin America and Europe. I lead the European um, operations. And what Chiron is really very focused on, we cover the whole value chain from seed to patient, 
but we really focused mostly on the access. So how do we make sure that all the great products that exist, that all the data is coming together and then make sure that the patients who are eligible for medical cannabis in the end get sufficient access to it? And how do we enlarge it and grow the market for it? So I would like to start my presentation to just like take a step back. What, what is cannabis? What the different categories of cannabis? Then I would move to the medical cannabis scheme in the UK and conclude with what, what can be done to increase cannabis. So as a step back, cannabis has like four various categories it can fall into. It's a generally a very genetic pro generic product. So we do have the medical cannabis where we talk about it's a narcotics, it's a prescription drugs drug. And uh, we have seen the legalization of medical cannabis in Europe in various countries, which I've listed. UK, Germany are the largest ones in Europe. The same product can also be a cosmetic. Usually um, cosmetics with cannabis are like tinctures, which are CBD or THC infused and which you apply to your skin. This would be the cosmetic regime of, of cannabis. Cannabis can also be a novel food. If you infuse, for example, a product um, which is then ingested with CBD, this is very common, then it would fall under the category of novel food, like a gummy bear with CBD in it. And we have the large uh, bucket, which is the recre recreational cannabis. It's where we have the most uh, prominent model is where in Canada, where you have shops where you can simply access even high THC products. And no, like depending on in which category of these products you fall, this will decide which regulatory pathway you have to go. What is really interesting about it that one product, each of the same product can fall into various uh, categories here. So if we just look at the high CBD oil, if used for the medical space, it would be a narcotic and then a prescription drug. It can also be a CBD oil infused in a cream, then it would fall under the cosmetics regulation. It can also be an oil which you can order on the market, which is just used as um, a supplement to your nutrition every day. Then it would fall under the novel food scheme or it could be recreational cannabis. What's important to note on the recreational cannabis that so far in all Europe, no country has really legalized uh, cannabis for recreational purposes. We've seen last year that Germany might be one of the first. We do know that, for example, the Netherlands have a decriminal decriminalization scheme, but a full recreational cannabis legalization, which we see in Canada, is not yet existing in Europe, and we have to see how it, um, how it turns out in the future. So now that we looked into all the different categories of cannabis, I would like to have a spotlight on the UK medical cannabis. UK medical cannabis was legalized a couple of years ago. It's still a very restricted and infant market, which is growing years over years. And Drug Science and Project 2021 are working on the access of medical cannabis to patients. So still we face a situation that by regulation, because cannabis is an unlicensed medicine. So as the name says, it doesn't have a license like other drugs as opioids. Um, it is still very limited um, by the regulation and a very high price. For now, only medical specialists, doctors can prescribe cannabinoid-based uh, medicine, which is including TBD only and THC products as it's unlicensed, as I mentioned. This is follows that this is not covered by the MHS. So the national health system doesn't cover a medication even if it's prescribed by a medical cannabis, cannabis specialist. Um, this is, by the way, interestingly different than in Germany and in Colombia. These and also Czech Republic, these are markets which do the reimbursement even as a first line treatment. What is great about the UK law that the existing law for uh, medical cannabis is open to any indication. So it's not that you say, okay, you can only use um, medical cannabis for chronic pain. It's pretty much up to the medical specialist. If he feels a patient is eligible, he can really go down the path and figure out with the patient which, for which indication, which cannabis is being used. Um, this being said, it's also open not to the indication side on the patient, but it's also very open on the product side. So as a patient, you can legally get in the UK dried flower for inhalation. You can also get mono substances where you really just have 
like synthesized THC or CBD as a mono substance, only substance in the product. You can get on the other side, full spectrum where there are different cannabinoids present in the product. And you can also get finished medicines like the ones Satibex and Epidiolex are the most common one. Um, to address these barriers, Chiron um, teamed up which, uh, in project 2021 in the year back then in 2019, which um, addresses to lower the barriers for cannabis um, getting into the hands of patients who are eligible for it with a subsidized pricing model. And this is um, really the Chiron um, approach that we say we need to make sure that the products which are legal by law and which doctors can prescribe are being prescribed. Because what is also a reality which we're facing, just that regulators allow medical cannabis technically doesn't mean that patients really get access. And I think the bridge in between from, okay, there's a law, it's, it's a written piece of paper to be, very, um, to be very like real about it. It's a written piece of paper, but this doesn't mean that a patient in the end gets the product. There is something in between. And this is where Chiron is very dedicated because the products are there. We just have to make sure that patients get that. Looking at the UK, there's a population of 67 million people. So if we just rule, uh, use the rule of thumb, which we know from Canada, that at least 1% of the populations are medical cannabis patients, we see that the UK market has a huge potential. And this is why we're so dedicated on it because the number of legal patients who are not forced to go to the illegal market is um, around the thousands of numbers, where it could be at around 700,000. So there's a huge potential which we have to untap as an industry. And uh, we as Karen realized nobody's doing it for us as the NHS is not covering it yet. It's really on us as an industry together with other companies to find the right products, find the right data, compile all of that and with that grow the patient base the legal patient base, because we also know that for now, a lot of patients are forced to go to the illegal market, which is um, a situation which we all have to work on. Going to the production of medical cannabis, and as I said, with Kyra more focused production, we don't see the production just as growing cannabis. For us, the production is the full span from starting at the seed, the right quality, working with the doctors and getting a safe product into the hands of patients. So generally there is a huge difference between just weed you can buy everywhere and medical cannabis. Um, as Kelly pointed out very correctly, there are very, very strict rules on cannabis, how it is grown. It's very hard to grow cannabis outdoor in a standardized quality. It's easy to grow just cannabis, but it's very hard to grow cannabis that would convince all the testing that Kali mentioned before. And it's exact the same product this week, next week, and the next year. And this is where medical cannabis is focused on. We need to make sure that the same product is available each and every time. And this is how the market starts and how we can grow it. Um, there are lots of regulations. One is the German monograph, which really, um, defines what is in the spec sheet, so what's allowed, what irradiation method you can use in order to uh, reduce the microbiobials, my, microbiota in a product, what THC content you can have, how the testing methods are. So it's a very strict regime which you have to follow, follow in order to be um, medical cannabis. Um, where we do realize that the supply is there, we have to make sure now these days that the supply is there all the time in the same quality. And this is an issue we as Chiron tackle in um, the UK market. We also realize that for the production of medical cannabis, it's also very important that prescribers and patients realize that medical cannabis is legal and also what product can be prescribed and that they understand the product. And here there's a lack because medical cannabis kind of did the other way around. We know cannabis, medical cannabis for thousands of years. We know that it works. We just now have to work backwards and show it in trials. So we know it works in man, but we now have to show that it works in mice. And this is what we as an industry have to do. We go the other way around. Usually you start with an API, you develop the drug, and then you do the testing. Cannabis followed the other way around. So we really um, understand that it's about the brand, a reliable brand for doctors and patients which they can trust and where they can rely on that the supply chain is so robust that they can always access the product because it's helping. Because 
The availability of a product somewhere in Europe doesn't mean that the patient get it. As I said, the value chain, and I want to uh, show it in pictures, like what we're covering and what is needed in order to ensure that the law, which says, okay, medical cannabis is legal, uh, comes to reality and the patient can safely use a product. So I think when we, when we speak about production, everybody would think of the picture, which is on the left-hand side, like a production space. Of course, this is where all the magic starts. But then there's the next step. Then in Europe and, um, for example, in the UK, you have to register a product. And with this registration, you really define the spec sheet of your product. You say, for example, the Chiron 20 to 1 has 20% THC, 1% CBD. And this is a spec sheet which you have to then comply with all the time. I couldn't go there and bring next time uh, a product with 50%. THC, because then it wouldn't follow my registration. So with the registration, I define my product such that doctors and patients can rely when they acquire a Chi-121 that it has always um, the same plus or minus 10% specifications um, in the product. So this is the next step. You decide, okay, which product can help, and then you register it. And then the next thing is, and this is what I showed here, um, it's a script. You have to convince a doctor to say, okay, I go down that path. It's an unlicensed medicine. So for a doctor, it's generally safer and easier to prescribe opioids, which would also be covered by the NHS. But we have to convince a doctor with our evidence and data that this product can work for him. And what I just want to show is like, if he wants to prescribe a product, he has to take the decision which product. So in this example, he writes down Chiron, dried flower to vape, THC 20%, CBD 1%, and then how many grams a patient gets. And with this script, the product is then finally being dispensed and you can see it in the picture below. So it's a very pharma route type such that the patient and doctor can rely on what's been registered is what's ending up in the hands of patients. Finally, how do we increase um, patient access in the UK? As I mentioned, it's a lot on the education side. So I, I've just seen in the chat, somebody said, well, um, it's about the evidence and the data. And that's absolutely right. We have to understand our product. We have to bring them in a standardized quality each and every month because it's a monthly script for a patient who needs the product. And with that, we have to lower the barriers because there's still a certain stigma in the market. And we can only tackle that if we work together as an industry and bring the evidence, which is so much needed in order to give prescribers and patients the healthy and safe environment to, to try these products. What would be the end game for us at Chiron is that in the, UK, in the UK, we have the same reimbursement scheme, which we do have in Germany and Colombia, such that with the evidence, we can show the NHS, well, this is a product that helps patients, the patient need it, and so the patient should have coverage for that product. And this is what we try to build out with Drug Science Project 2021 and our, within our own Zerenia clinic, where we see patients every day. We collect these data in order to then be able to um, convince more doctors and in the end, the NHS. Well, and that's it from me. Happy to answer questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, I, I really like that. I've never thought about that having, you know, we, we know what it, how it works in men. Now we have to prove it in mice. I might, <laughs> I might steal that another time. Um, so I will just uh, ask some questions now for everyone who just spoke. Um, so friends, I guess here, just because you're still here, but there's a, there's a question about whether yeah, uh, whether um, Kieran's thinking of setting up a UK production facility, if they're thinking about entering the UK market. Yes, so we are present on the market with two of our products already, so they can be prescribed um, every day already. For us, it doesn't really matter where it's been produced, because we understand the product um, can be grown anywhere under the right conditions. So what we do is we focus on the strains, because we're now in the dried flower market. So we focus on the strains, and where it's grown, we have a large network. What I do feel is that maybe we in Southern Europe, the product generally grows a bit better, but we are generally non-agnostic. 
So if we find the right partner within the UK, there's absolutely no reason on holding us back to grow within the UK for the UK market. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and Kelly, there was um, a question someone was just actually just asking if you could just briefly explain what the terpenes are again. Um, and I think also there was a bit of interest about how the kind of radiate, um, irradiating the products uh, helps to kind of, yeah. Yep, not a problem. So terpenes are the, the beautiful smelling compounds within the plant. You're probably really familiar with terpenes. If you've got a lavender plant in your garden, that's full of linalol. And cannabis also produces these same compounds. And they're produced in the, the glandular trichromes of the plants in the same place that the cannabinoids are produced. But you've got bigger terpenes and smaller terpenes. So you've got monoterpenes, which are much smaller, which are made in a particular type of trichrome, the, the glandular ones with the, the cannabinoids. But then you've got the sequestral terpenes, which are much bigger, which are made in the hair-like structures as well. And these all have different effects and all work in conjunction to produce the entourage effect, which we've probably all heard about. And we've not even talked about flavonoids or touched on any of the other kind of lignans and things there, but the terpenes are the smells that you actually get um, and the mixtures of those that you're quite familiar with. You mentioned about the irradiation, and yes, I've been answering some of the questions and it, it's um, some of the studies have actually read um, that there is no real effect on the cannabinoid or terpene content. The drying process actually affects the uh, terpene uh, profile the, the most, but it's antioxidant compounds and anti-cancer compounds that they've actually found that have been reduced by this irradiation process. Um, there's a number of different ones. There's, there's gamma radiation, and the latest one that seems to be very popular is the cold plasma, which seems to be a lot more effective, but doesn't cause as much um, crisping of the flower as such. It doesn't cause it to dry out quite as, as rapidly. Um, it, they're basically used as sterilizing methodologies, but um, water activity, which was, which was something I didn't mention in my talk, which is something that should be reported, actually is all about the, the amount of energy the water has got within the flower. And it's basically how much energy is there to support life. Now, if that water activity is down below, I think it's about 0.6, you won't get any growth of any microbes within that. So the irradiation shouldn't be needed. Um, but if it, these products are going to the amino suppress, somebody who is already kind of sick, it's a kind of a safety net really to just to stop any kind of bugs such as the E. coli, which can be quite deadly to someone or salmonella. Um, so yeah, it's, as I say, the studies are showing that there's no real effect on cannabinoids and terpenes by this irradiation, but other compounds there is. Yeah, no, brilliant, thank you so much. As you rightly said, we're just oh, at the beginning in understanding this, right? I would you like to pick up like who can exactly prescribe? So um, there is a way to virtually only prescribe. What really happens is that within, you can reach out to several clinics and they will test your eligibility before. So they will um, basically get all your data from the GP. And then you could see virtually or in person a medical specialist and see if you're eligible um, for medical cannabis. So generally every um, specialist can prescribe. There was a question from Lorna. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I've just turned my, I, I, I've just turned my camera off again because I was, I, I think I was starting to drop off, so I've just hidden, but I'm still here. Um, and Greg, there was also a question for you, which I thought was really interesting, which is, does the, the model that you use for your um, data take into like the, the account, the kind of severity or scale of anxiety or insomnia or any of the indications you mentioned? Yeah, it, so the way it's designed is you know, we come up with this initial range from a genetic profile to start with. Uh, for, you know, as I showed you in the, in the slides, and then based on the data that we gather through the device, because it's, uh, it's giving us a feedback, both in terms of how much is being dosed, uh, when it's being dosed, what the, you know, we ask questions prior to if it's for insomnia, uh, certain questions about sleep, if it's pain, you know, where things are on a certain scale, uh, prior to a, prior to a, a, a session. And then afterwards uh, for pain, it may be 30 minutes later for insomnia, it might be the next morning, ask a number of questions. Um, and there's also other things you know, like uh, 
what did you eat, how much did you exercise, et cetera, things like that on, on, uh, in that day that may impact uh, metabolism components and things like this. And then through the data sets that we gather over a period of time, uh, the AI uh, you know, underneath all of our, uh, our databases uh, helped to dial in specifically uh, you know, for somebody that's got a high, you know, high tolerance to pain or a more severe pain than not. Um, like on that one graph I showed up on the, on the, uh, the app where there were the sort of the circles that kind of looked like a, you know, a dartboard um, that can track sort of where the pain management was for, for that individual patient on a day-by-day -day basis uh, with other data sets in terms of some of the lifestyle issues and then be able to dial in specifically, okay, based on today, what's going on, I may need a higher dose than, than, I, than I needed yesterday. And so uh, it's, a smart, uh, you know, it's a smart device and, and the AI is smart underneath it that learns with the patient over time. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you also, Greg, uh, Callie and Franzi, thank you so much. Um, That's brilliant. I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions. But again, if anyone wants to type answers in um, into the Q&A thing, please do. Uh, so we will now be going on to our last section of this evening, which will be our section on medical cannabis. Um, we'll be hearing from four speakers. So um, I think we'll be hearing from Claire, um, Professor Mike Barnes, uh, Dr. Neeraj Singh and Dr. Liz Iveson. So Claire, if you're happy, um, if we could start with you, please. Hi, everyone. Um, so I want to thank Drug Science for inviting me along and giving me the opportunity to share my experience as a medical cannabis user. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to people talk so far and I've definitely learned a lot um, so far. So I think my talk today will kind of touch a point touch upon many of the points that have been brought up in this conference and there's not going to be a PowerPoint and there's not going to be any pictures and but what I do hope to offer is an insight into like the human service user side of this experience and I will talk about my time as a pa patient under project 2021 but to do that I need to talk about my experience as a medical cannabis user as a whole and why and that'll help highlight why it's so important for people to have access to this medicine um now i don't know if anyone here is in this position where they might want to consider using medical cannabis and if they have concerns this talks for people in that position or maybe for prescribers who might be on the fence about introducing medical cannabis into their practice and maybe for the people who held the same views that i had on cannabis before i ended up using it so I guess to start, I need to tell you how I got sick in the first place. I was 13. I was a really active kid. and I was really lucky that my parents could afford to send me to horse riding and karate. And it was on a horse riding trip, a camping trip when I was 13 that I fell off a horse and landed on my feet, chased after it. And I was OK. And I got I got back onto the horse. And however, when I got home, it became really apparent that I was having a lot of hip pain and little by little it started to affect everything I had to stop engaging in my martial arts and soon it was sore to sit all the time it was sore to walk and bit by bit the illness the pain got worse and the thing is when you have an injury at that age or when you start to experience chronic pain when you're 13 it's insidious you don't really see what the impact is until years on when you start to grow up and socializing is is really important to, to maintain friendships and going to school every day is really important so that you can learn how to pass your exams and I had the constant belief as I was growing up and I was living with chronic pain and I was seeing all these specialists that I was just one tablet one medication one treatment one diagnosis away from finding what was wrong with me and curing this hip pain and and that's really important because when I when I had that there was no depression or anxiety I did believe that this was a temporary state and that's important to bring up because a lot of the time my pain at this point was being contributed to anxiety however when I was 15 I managed to finally get an operation and they found that when I fell off the horse I kind of like cracked my pelvis and I'd been walking on it for three or four years and because I'd been de dealing with that pain for so long, my whole body became sensitized and I was finally diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And this is really important because at 15 years old, so 16, sorry, when I was going into my fifth year at hires, I'd already failed my standard grades because again, I hadn't been 
to school as much as I could have been. I was given 1300 milligrams of gabapentin today and expected to function. Now to let you understand, I know somebody, a six foot one man who was on 300 milligrams a day and they struggled to function. Consequently, I failed all my exams and I had to go do extra courses to catch up. And finally, when I was 18, I was given my first sets of opiates and my pain team did the best they could with the tools that they had at the time. And by the time that I was 23, I was on over 480 tablets a month. And this was a combination of opiates, diazepam, antidepressants, um, stomach liners to cope with all the tablets I was taking. And even at this point, I was in my fourth year of university. I still didn't have a full life. I couldn't manage a 12 hour, uni like 12 hour week university course. I struggled to maintain any of the clients that I did have for my piano lessons. And I just, I could socialize maybe once a month. The impact it had for all the tablets I was taking, it, it was starting to wear, it was starting to wear thin. And that was also the year when I found out I was diagnosed with endometriosis. Now, this is really important because at this point, right, I was jaded and I was cynical. I'd had over 14 medications all these treatments as snake oil salesmen coming through at this point and I found out that the one thing left that I wanted to do because I knew I'd always struggle to get a job if I was constantly in pain my ability to have kids wasn't there anymore and that hearing that at 23 after what I had already lost my social life my ability to go to college just to be an independent woman it, it, it devastated me and at this point, I really struggled to kind of see a sense of continuing with life because what was the point? Medication was giving me a half life. It was getting worse as I was getting older. And this is important because it was then that year, a friend approached me and said to me, Claire, have you tried medical cannabis? Now, so 2015, it was still illegal. And to let you understand, like despite me being a musician and a pain patient, you know, I had nothing to do with any drugs. I wasn't a big alcohol drinker I wasn't able to because I couldn't go out to socialize because of my medications and I had all these like preconceived notions that you would be schizophrenic or psychotic if you tried it I was totally zero drugs but I was also really really desperate and at the point where I genuinely couldn't see any other route for me so I tried it and that year was the first year in my life, despite having an operation, despite doing a dissertation, despite working within the community in choirs and developing my own music studio, I graduated with straight A's. And that was the year that I came off all the excess medication and I essentially just stayed on 100 cocodamol tablets a month. And there were fluctuations of maybe trying back within for a month or two just because I didn't have a reliable supply of medication or, or anything like that. And what I, what I want to highlight about when I was an illegal user at that time was the amount of risk I was putting myself into. So at the time I was in a small town and I had a really like prominent piano studio. I worked a lot with kids and you know, I was working in dementia choirs and working in the community. So for me, I had to have PVG clearance. The risk of me getting caught with cannabis and this showing up on my PVG would have buckled the little career choices that I had due to my chronic pain medication. But the relief I got from this cannabis was what allowed me to even have a chance of approaching these activities in the first place, because beforehand, it was simply opiates. I was also at risk of exploitation from people when I remember going to like see somebody to deal with drugs and they said to me if I couldn't afford it I could pay with sexual favours. I was having to go meet people in car parks on my own as a vulnerable disabled woman. Now with a medical cannabis script that's completely changed and it was in January 2020 when I finally was able to join Project 2021 which subsidised my medication and since January 2020, I can now say that I don't use any opiates or any other medication to handle my pain condition of endometriosis and fibromyalgia. Um, I'm able to go walking and do exercise and 
since January 2020, I've been able to work full time at a crisis shelter for young people at risk of suicide and self harm. I've been able to see a doctor who could medicate me and allow me to get pain relief at the start of the day without impacting my judgment so I could deliver that support to young people. And I was able to do that without the worry of prosecution or fear or putting myself at risk that came with having no access to legal medical cannabis. And, you know, when you finally do get a bit of relief from chronic pain and you're able to build yourself up in between all these bouts and these acute periods of pain, you're able to do more. You're able to do more things that give you a sense of achievement. You're able to do more things that give you a sense of connection. And these experiences are all really important when it comes to treating and working with chronic pain people. And it's really hard to move on in that journey if you don't have the relief in between it. And that's what I found I got with medical cannabis. Now that I have access to it, what I get from this medication, which at this point is just one mil of oil in the morning and maybe a puff in the afternoon of my vape if I'm sore, and then definitely at night time, I'm down to basically no medication and being able to operate and function without feeling that I'm under the influence of THC, it's which I didn't have access to when I was in the illegal market, which of course only had THC heavy strains. So I guess I would say to people who are maybe unsure or nervous about looking into medical cannabis is if that if your experience sounds a lot like mine, if you've had dozens of different medications and procedures and you're cynical because of everything that you had to cope with, with people trying to sell you remedies that didn't work, give medical cannabis a try. I cannot overstate how much having access to it has saved my life because before it, at the point of where I was at, there was no quality of life that I felt was worth living at that point. And I think this is why it's really, really important to be doing this sort of work to be doing like as we're saying working backwards testing from the man onto the mice and to show that medical cannabis works because the years when I before I had access to it put me at risk at so many things from prosecution which could have affected my career choices to being with people and having to engage with people who weren't maybe so as good as they should have been that's essentially what my story kind of comes down to is a testimony of my time accessing medical cannabis. Um, Project 2021, of course, has given me the ability to access medication and afford it, whereas before I wouldn't have had that option because obviously as a disabled person and the impact I had on my education, my career choices are more likely to have been affected by poverty and less likely to access this medication. It has genuinely saved my life. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that all with us. Um, I'm sure there's going to be questions for you and we'll come back to them, but what an amazing story, but thank you. Um, okay, so um, from there, we'll now be hearing from Professor Mike Barnes. And again, keep putting your questions in um, and we will get to them at the end of this next bit. Thank you. And uh, thank you for asking me. That was an inspiring story and uh, I've enjoyed the other talks very much. So thank you. My task, uh, well, basically, it's a brief introduction. I'm a neurologist, basically. Um, and so uh, I'm not a neuroscientist. And um, so therefore, I may be not quite the right person to unravel the scientific aspects of how cannabis does its job, but I'll have a go in 15 minutes. Um, and I'm mainly going to describe the endocannabinoid system, uh, which is the main but not the only way that cannabis uh, affects the body. So I'll share some slides. Um, bear with me just a second while we do that. There we go. And the slideshow from beginning. Here we are. Okay. Uh, again, I'm conscious that uh, there's about 100, there were about 150 people on this uh, uh, evening, and I'm sure some of you are neuro neurologists, neuroscientists, 
uh, clinicians with an interest who understand the endocannabinoid system. Uh, so, but I'm sure there's, I'm told there are equally people who don't. So if you do understand it, now is the time to pop off and have a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or whatever you take your fancy and come back in 15 minutes. Uh, but I'm going to try and uh, unravel just very simply uh, the intricacies of the endocannabinoid system. Um, it's actually been discovered in, 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 in relative terms quite recently. This is the guy who unraveled both THC, CBD and the endocannabinoid system. And him and his team, uh, uh, Professor Raphael Meshulam, who's uh, still... Uh, very sprightly at the age of 91, and uh, his team in Tel Aviv only from 1964, I think it was, that he unraveled THC, and then from there to the 1990s began to unravel the endocannabinoid system, which is still unraveling, if that's the right word. So um, many thanks from all of us uh, to Professor Meshulam. Um, for those who don't know, um, um, all pretty well, not all, but virtually all bodily functions are controlled by the nervous system. Where nerves meet, they don't actually touch, but there's a small gap between them called the synaptic cleft. And when a nerve signal comes down one nerve and is detected that nerve ending, a small packet, which I think is probably the right word, of chemicals is released from that nerve ending. They're called neurotransmitters. There's about 50-ish of them. Uh, I looked them up tonight just to see what the latest was on the, on the web, and there was a variations from about 20 to over 100. So I put 50. Uh, and we are, we are from, I'm sure all of us are familiar with some of them like dopamine, which is lacking in Parkinson's disease, opioids, histamine, serotonin, et cetera, et cetera. They all serve slightly different functions. So probably most of you sort of vaguely knew that. Um, that neurotransmitter, that packet of, of chemicals, then as soon as that signal is really, is, comes down the nerve, it crosses over the synaptic cleft and links with a receptor on the next nerve, so-called postsynaptic nerve. And once that neurotransmitter is linked with that receptor, that induces a rush of positive ions, such as calcium and sodium, into the nerve, which triggers a nerve impulse, which carries on down that nerve to the end organ, such as moving your finger or your foot, uh, or, or just passes on to the next nerve down the chain. Very simplistically, that's how the system works. And this just illustrates that for you. And here we have a, a neuron, let's say that's in the brain, to move your finger, for example, that will never come from the brain to the neck. It will then join with the nerve that then goes down the arm uh, to move the finger, for example. And that here yeah, you can see a tiny little uh, representation of where the nerves don't touch, but where they join, and there's the synaptic cleft in between that you can see there. So here's the, the nerve impulse comes down. As soon as it's detected, this packet of chemicals is released. The chemicals cross the synaptic cleft, link with the receptor on the other side, and that triggers the signal to carry on down the nerve to move your finger, for example. And when those transmitters have done their job, they're either degraded or they're taken back up by the original nerve to put back into a new packet awaiting the new transmission. So very simplistically, that's how the nerve works. But when you think about it, how does it switch itself off? Now it will switch itself off mainly because the signal from the top nerve stops coming down and so there's no more chemicals released. But also this major controlling system called the endocannabinoid system um, is able to switch that off or modulate it, a sort of negative feedback loop, if you like. It just reduces that signal. It's the most prevalent and most important neurotransmitter system in the body. This, as, as an aside, it's really quite astonishing that actually this is not really taught to any extent in medical schools. When I was at medical school, they hadn't discovered it. But now, even now, it's been known about and unraveled for the last 20 plus years. It's still not very much taught, considering it is the most important neurotransmitter system in the body. So the endocannabinoid system consists of some of those receptors, and I'll show you a picture in a moment. Um, there's more of them, but most we know about is called CB1 and CB2. There are others. Um, CB1 is mainly found in the brain and the spinal cord, but also in the immune system, the reproductive system, heart, lung, bladder, et cetera, et cetera, all over the body. Wherever there's a nerve, there's a CB receptor. CB2, similar, but mainly focused on the immune system. Then we know this, we produce two chemicals, that's all vertebrates, it's not just humans, it's all vertebrates, produce at least two chemicals, almost certainly more, that bind to those receptors. Um, they're mainly called anandamide and 2-AG. So the whole endocannabinoid system are those receptors, those chemicals that bind to those receptors, and the enzymes that make those chemicals and break those chemicals down once their job is done. So let's look a little bit at that. 
uh, this is similar to what I showed you before. Here's the neuron before the synaptic cleft, the presynaptic neuron. Here's the neuron after the synaptic cleft, the postsynaptic neuron. Here are these packets of chemicals in this slide. Two of them are just called glutamate and GABA. You may have heard of those. They could be dopamine, they could be serotonin, whatever it is. Those, the packet of chemicals is released. Off it goes across the synaptic cleft, binds to those receptors on the other side. And as soon as that um, binding is detected, then these endocannabinoid chemicals are manufactured. They're not waiting there, they're manufactured on demand. Uh, and this one shows an andamide and 2-AG. They're released and they go backwards across the synaptic cleft in the other direction. And they bind to these CB receptors on the other side here. And as soon as they're binding to those receptors, that switches the signal off. So it's a very simple system, really. It's a negative feedback loop that controls, modulates so-called homeostasis uh, to reduce that signaling. And that, in a nutshell, is the endocannabinoid system. That's nothing to do with the plant at the moment, nothing at all. But the phytocannabinoids in the plant interact with this system. But let's have a quick look at just those natural um, chemicals. There's 2-AG. I won't bore you unless people are interested. There's a lot of information about it. We know what makes it. I won't go through what's in the brackets there because that's just the, the chemical names for those interested. We know what breaks them down. We know they bind fully, the 2-AG binds fully to that CB1 and other receptors. But it's not that simple. I just want to emphasize that. This is a simple view because those 2-AG does bind to other receptors as well. So it's not as simple as I'm sort of having to make out. The other one is called anandamide. That's interesting. It's called it's Sanskrit for joy or bliss. Again, we know what makes it. We know what breaks it down. We know it binds uh, not quite as well as 2-AG, but to the CB receptors. And other receptors, again, in curiosity, it's high in chocolate, and it goes up after physical exercise, the so-called runner's high. Um, so there again, they're the natural products, nothing to do with the plant. And that's a, a confusing slide, but that just shows you, we know what makes nandamide. It crosses the synaptic cleft, goes backwards, binds to those CB receptors and other receptors. You can see two called GPR55 and TRPV1 there. When they've done their job of switching the signal off, they're broken down. And that's the endocannabinoid system. What does it actually do, though? Well, what I've described, it inhibits neuronal neurotransmitter release. That's what I've just des described to you. It's a negative feedback loop. It's a homeostatic role in energy balance and metabolism. OK, that's all very interesting. But what does that mean in real practical terms? And it means a lot of things, because it's a system that, that controls all those nerves. So it basically controls every bodily function, in a sense. What, as a sort of a random number of things here, it regulates anxiety behavior. It has a role in extinction of old memories and short-term memory impairment. It increases appetite. You can begin to see some overlap here with the, the effects that we know of cannabis, which interacts with this system. You know, we know the munchies uh, when we take um, uh, recreational cannabis, for example. But the natural system also has anti-inflammatory role. It's analgesic, helps pain. It controls temperature. It helps sleep. It goes on. You can go on for a lot more slides than this. It has a role in controlling our motor function. It has a role in, in generating new nerves and adapting existing nerves, so-called neuroplasticity. It reduces tone in the bladder. If the bladder is very tight muscle, it will relax that muscle. That can happen and be a problem, in, for example, multiple sclerosis. It reduces the, the motility, the, the spasm in the gut. The gut and is anti-inflammatory in the gut, so you can see a role it might have in things like Crohn's disease and inflammatory bowel disease. It has a role in embryo implantation. It has a key role in controlling a response to cancer. It has an anti-cancer role. So that's a lot of things. A lot of diseases and disease states are covered there. So that brings me to the, the science of the cannabis plant. The cannabinoids produced in the plant, as we've heard so eloquently in the previous talks, are called phytocannabinoids. Um, we all know about THC and CBD, but there's, I thought there was, a, somebody said earlier, there's 144. When I went to Israel last week, uh, we told there's now 160, so it's going up all the time. And, you know, we've quite a lot about two, a little bit about another three or four, and not a lot about about 150 of them. So there's a long way to go to understand the plant. There's about 160 of these cannabinoids, and some of them, probably not all of them, combine to those same CB receptors that I've been describing, and thus the plant phytocannabinoids mimic the effects of our own natural endocannabinoid system. For example, THC binds to that CB1 and CB2 receptor. Uh, not as well as we heard as the synthetic um, uh, cannabinoids, but it certainly binds to those receptors. 
Again, it's not quite as simple as that. CBD, for example, is not very good at binding, but it binds to other receptors. It has a role in increasing the natural level of anandamide. So CBD and the other cannabinoids do work in different ways, but generally they all stimulate, modulate, adjust our own endocannabinoid system. Just to put a pretty slide in, uh, I think we'll hear about more of these in coming years. There are other plants uh, that also produce chemicals, not necessarily cannabinoids, that interact with their endocannabinoid system. Uh, these aren't controlled at the moment, so in years to come, we might see um, you know, uh, chemicals from echinacea or black pepper beginning to be used uh, as cannabinoid-like medicines. So in summary, I think I've nearly come to my time, let's summarize what we said. The plant phytocannabinoids, the phytocannabinoids in the plant, interact to an extent with our own inbuilt endocannabinoid system and other, other uh, neurotransmitter systems. They have a widespread actual and potential medical use because the endocannabinoid system has such a widespread role in the control of virtually all bodily functions. Now that, if you think about it, that's very unlike the pharmaceuticals we are familiar with. Like if you have a new blood pressure pill, that controls blood pressure and doesn't do much else. If you have a new antibiotic, it um, kills some bacteria and not much else. So we're used to a single molecule pharmaceutical product doing a single thing. Doctors are used to that. Patients are used to that. So the, the way it works does make it rather easy for cynics to say that cannabis must be some sort of snake oil because it can't, we're not, we can't have a medicine that does all those different things from anxiety to pain to cancer control. So it's easy to see uh, how that can be misinterpreted, if you like. But when you know how it works through the endocannabinoid system and you know the endocannabinoid system does such a range of things, it's easy to see how potentially really helpful the plant cannabis uh, can be in, in a whole range of medical diseases. Those we know now, like we've heard about pain and anxiety and muscle spasm, but many, many more roles I'm sure will be unraveled in the future as we unravel those other 150 plus cannabinoids and the terpenes, which we shouldn't forget, will also have a medical function. So that's uh, hopefully not too quick, uh, but a, a summary of a little bit about where, how much we understand about the science of cannabis. And that's it, thank you very much. I'll unshare yeah, my you. screen. There we go. Thank you so much. Oh, I've self but there. Um, yeah, I can confirm having literally just been through medical school that it is still not taught in medical school. I don't think it's Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's pretty disgraceful, <laughs> isn't it? It's such an important thing. Whatever you think of cannabis, for Kevin's sake, let's, let's, let's get taught oh, about yeah. the endocannabinoid system. I oh, yeah, could not yeah. agree more. But brilliant. And we'll come to hope. Well, we may or may not have time for Q&A at the end. We'll see how we go. But... Okay. Um, it is now my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Niraj Singh. Tell me if I've pronounced anything wrong because I've been doing it all day today. Uh, yep, but yeah, yep, he's going to no, talk no. about prescribing medical cannabis. Yes, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks, Anna, for that introduction. And uh, thank you, Mike, for that talk. Thanks to everybody, really. And Claire, particular thanks to yourself for that really powerful testimony. Uh, I mean, this is why I do this, really, is for the stories like that. Um, now I'm going to try and share my screen, but I'm a bit of a tech dinosaur, so forgive me. Um, Absolutely fine, Liz. If you're happy to jump on now. Although she may not be here. <laughs> yeah, I've just arrived. Oh, oh brilliant. Oh, perfect oh, thank time. You. <laughs> Come back. Well, I've sort of arrived. Yeah, look at my screen. That's fine. Well, I've got 15 um, minutes to work this out. <laughs> brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, let me just get my, my screen up. Can you see my screen? Not, oh yes, there we go. Yeah, okay. Oh, well, slightly earlier than expected. So if I, if any children come in during my talk, then uh, I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, so I'm, um, I'm Liz Iveson, I'm a, um, my background is in stroke and neuro rehab and, um, and I've been prescribing medical cannabis now for um, uh, around three years. Um, uh, we, I was one of the early, early ad adopters with, um, with uh, Professor Barnes. Um, and um, I'm, as part of my neuro rehab work, I've, I've come across um, quite a few people that are showing um uh symptoms and and uh, and problems and signs with long covid so 
And so my, my, I'm covering the link between medical cannabis and its potential in long COVID, which I think is really interesting. Um, so just a quick um, overview of what is long COVID. So um, it's the definition of, is of signs of symptoms that develop um, during or after infection with um, the SARS um, COVID uh, coronavirus which continue for more than 12 weeks and are not explained by an alternative diagnosis. And that's very important. And long COVID itself is a, is a debilitating multi-system illness. It affects many different systems in the body. It affects many different organs and it, um, its presentation is um, different in pretty much every, every individual. And it's very similar to a lot of the other conditions that um, I as a neuro rehab consultant manage and a lot of our, my colleagues manage and, and see patients that are already um, finding benefit with medical cannabis. Um, the, it's very rare that, um, particularly with patients with long COVID, they have just one isolated symptom, and that's the same in multiple other um, disease states, such as multiple sclerosis and um, polymyalgia, for example. And uh, the, the long COVID is a problem and it is going to be more of a problem. Um, there's an estimated sort of 1.3 million people in the UK um, self-report symptoms of long COVID, but that's likely to be quite a gross underestimate. And more recent studies have suggested between 10 and 25% of patients that have had um, COVID still report some residual symptoms six to 12 weeks post-infection. Um, the... Um, this is in the BMJ at the end of last year, which really just sort of is an illustration of, of, um, of the different organs that um, uh, coronavirus affects. And you've just, it links in very well, I think, with Mike's talk of, of uh, you, there is some very similarities in the, in the where coronavirus affects compared to um, where the endocannabinoid system and where um, the CB CBD receptors are. So, um, so the, the way that um, coronavirus works is um, it, it's the virus uh, breaks into cells um, via uh, angiotensin II receptor, um, which is located on the surface of the cells. And it uses a couple of proteins, ACE2 and um, I think it's TP, TMPR um, protein to actually enter the cells. And then once it's inside the cells, it, it generates a series of inflammatory responses and um, intercellular um, cytokine production, which then cause the cell not to function properly and you get all these different symptoms. And we're all familiar with the acute symptoms of, of, of COVID, you know, such as breathlessness and loss of smell and taste and, um, uh, and some cognitive symptoms as well. And the most common um, long COVID reported symptoms are similar to, to that of acute COVID. Um, however, the, the, uh, and, um, the breathlessness is, is, is still the most commonly reported ongoing symptom. But there are many other symptoms and, and the more that um, people, long COVID is studied, the, the more common these symptoms are, are being found in, in the general population. Um, uh, particularly um, cognitive and memory difficult concentration and brain fog seems to be much more common than we initially thought. Um, and the relevance to this in medical cannabis is these are also very common symptoms um, reported in um, patients that are seeking medical cannabis. So I'll just flip back to here. So, um, so this study um, is, is hot off the press. It came out a couple of days ago. And, and again, it, it just shows about 70% of long COVID patients um, experience difficulty concentrating in memory. And half of the patients in the study report difficulties is actually getting anybody to take the symptoms seriously. Um, and it, it does have quite a big impact on, on, on work. And currently the management of long COVID is very much based on symptomatic management and rehabilitation. So um, the NHS have implemented long COVID clinics for the more severe end of the spectrum, and they've been inundated with referrals. And currently the waiting list for my local clinics over 18 months. So are many, many patients currently self-managing, self-led treatment um, on a limited resource. And then, as I say, the waiting list for, for specific rehabilitation and, and specific pacing and fatigue management is, is 
is very long. So the need for other um, treatment options um, in long COVID is, is obviously very, very needed. So where does medical cannabis come into all of this? So this is a, um, this is a snapshot from a, 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 a separate drug science study called 2021, which um, uh, is, it looks, and this, this has looked at the main conditions why people have sought medical cannabis um, in the woman, pain, closely followed by anxiety, um, PTSD and epilepsy. Um, and then on top of that, the secondary conditions that people also described and symptoms, again, anxiety, depression, insomnia, neuropathic pain. And again, the very, sim very similar um, presentations and symptoms that patients with long COVID are presenting with. Um, so it, from an, it, it does make sense intuitively that we're already treating these symptoms um, in patients with medical cannabis and very successfully um, in my experience, particularly sleep, um, anxiety and, and pain. Um, and therefore one would suggest um, cannabis should help um, these symptoms in, in long COVID as well. Um, so. So going back to, so, so that's on a very simplistic basis, I think medical cannabis and long COVID could help each other, you know, medical cannabis could help long COVID based on just a symptom, symptom management um, perspective. Um, uh, uh, once you've tried the conventional symptom management for, for the particular symptoms. Um, but what is, what's really quite interesting and quite exciting potentially is, is the potential for medical cannabis to actually um, um, modify the disease itself. Um, so again, just just reminding that the, you know the, these ACE two receptors, which the coronavirus um, has an impact on, are in um, pretty much all these different organs and are spread throughout your body. And then if you go back to the endocannabinoid system, again the CBD one and CBD two receptors again present in multiple um, organs and, and areas of the body. And if you remember Mike Barnes's talk, um, a lot of the um, potential benefits and what the endocannabinoid system does in autoregulation, um, you know, reduction of inflammation um, and sort of uh, reduction of, of stress, they, they, they have a potential benefit in the etiology and the symptom management of long COVID. Um, and in um, the, this recent study, uh, again, the etiology and, and uh, the, we're, we're discovering more and more about long COVID, but the, the core um, hypothesis of the way that um, the coronavirus works is through generation of inflammation and then an excessive immune response. And we know that the endocannabinoid system and therefore potentially can, and therefore cannabis um, has an impact in regulating this inflammation and, and immune response. And this is also backed up by, again, some more, uh, all very recently published studies. Um, this one was in Cell in, Mar in the beginning of March, um, and it looked at um, early risk factors for long COVID. So this is in patients presenting with acute COVID. And higher viral load was associated with your chan the more chance of getting long COVID. Um, the presence of certain autoantibodies suggesting some immune dysfunction. Um, diabetes um, and reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus. And EBV is very interesting. Um, over 95% of the population are carriers of EBV, but it doesn't, it's normally quite dormant and, and benign in, in people over teenage years. Um, but it's also more recently been Im implicated in the etiology for the conditions such as multiple sclerosis and chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, we already know for long COVID, being female, slightly older and having pre-existing health conditions, again, increase your risk of long COVID. But the, the top, the viral load, the reactivation and autoantibodies are, are relevant to, to cannabis and the endocannabinoid system. And this is this has been reflected in some studies and that these are all small studies and they're all, and, but the, the, they're being published, as one well, published um, over, so, there's some recent studies and some older studies. And what we do know is that microdoses of THC in vitro inhibit EBV reactivation of the virus. Um, and, uh, and therefore, um, there is some um, current thinking that, that, that THC 
um, may, if it inhibits the reactivation of um, EBV, um, may well help um, limit the um, symptoms and, um, and um, duration of, of, of long COVID by reducing the um, EBV reactivation, which therefore, which often causes fatigue and other other um, multi multiple problems. Um, CBD has also been shown to um, inhibit. Um, the coronavirus replication. And again, going back to what we know, the risk factors for long COVID, if we can reduce that viral load and inhibit the replication of the virus early on, that potentially has a, has a longer term impact on, on, on severity of disease. And a more recent, again, another study has, has confirmed that cannabidiol reduces the levels of um, inflammatory cytokines, which again is implicated in the um, etiology of long COVID. Um, and has antioxidative and anti-inflammatory properties. So it's all quite, quite interesting stuff that's coming out and the potential of cannabis in the management and potential treatment of long COVID, I think is really interesting. Um, so I'll just sort of conclude really with a bit of a, a, just a plug for the fact that we really do need more research into cannabis and long COVID. I'm a principal investigator um, along with um, uh, correlated co co with drug science, um, BOD and Altaflora. Um, and we've just got this study through the MHRA um, and Ethics Committee. Um, and we're looking at the, um, the safety, tolerability and feasibility of um, cannabidiol dominant medical cannabis. So it's um, 50 milligrams of CBD and two milligrams of THC. Um, medical cannabis um, in treating symptoms of long COVID, but we're also looking at some of the um, hemodynamic effects that we know are associated with long COVID as well. Um, this is an initial feasibility study. We're recruiting 30 patients um, and it's the first study of medical cannabis um, in long COVID to be approved by the MHRA. We're just in the recruitment phase at the moment. Primary outcomes are just a recruitment rate and retention and number of side effects. But the secondary outcomes are, are really quite detailed and looking again at, at long COVID symptoms, but also monitoring some vital signs and physiological measurements, um, which again are associated with um, regulation of the nervous system. Um, so we'll, we'll wait to see what the, the outcome of that, that's due to finish um, in about six months time. So just to conclude, I mean, long COVID is common. It's a debilitating multi-system condition. It's going to have a widespread impact on our working population. And we, there's an urgent need for us to find some treatment options. I think cannabis really is quite exciting at its potential in um, the management of, of particularly the symptoms of long COVID, but also potentially the um, uh, potentially uh, treatment options and limiting severity. But we need much more research. Um, so I think watch this space. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And thank you for jumping in. Uh, that was great and very, very interesting. Very, very, very topical at the moment. Um, good. So if, uh, Niraj, if you're ready and have cracked the, the screen share. Um, oh. <laughs> I kind of haven't, but Mags is going to help me. Thank you, Mags. Oh, brilliant. Good, yeah. good. Yeah. Excellent. Where there's a will. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, I will leave that then uh, oh, in both your um, Okay. Well, it wasn't that one, but um, that's absolutely fine. We'll we'll use this. What we're using ones. So that's absolutely fine. Uh, I'm sorry. I can't. For some reason, I think my video is disabled, so you can't see my mug. But that's not a problem. I hope anyway. Uh, but as long as you can see the slides, that's uh, that's absolutely great. So. My name is uh, Dr. Nij Singh. I'm a consultant psychiatrist. Uh, I've been a psychiatrist um, for around 16, 16 years now. And I came into the space uh, February 2020. Um, and around that time, uh, a major world event happened, as, as we all know. Um, we suddenly went from seeing patients face to face to doing um, virtual consultations, um, having virtual meetings as we are today. And um, essentially, we, we haven't looked back. Um, I think pretty much all my medical cannabis um, appointments have been virtual uh, since that time. 
And I think that is that is here to stay. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're not, we, though there will be people that do want to be seen face to face, and we certainly should be offering that to them. Um, virtual consultations will remain. I think it's a good thing. Uh, I think yeah, it's good for patients um, and it's good for carbon footprint. Um, it, it, you know, it's great that we can see people from the Shetland Islands, the Channel Islands, um, you know, the, the whole breadth of the UK um, and um, be able to provide these treatments to them. Um, that, that, that's what it's all about. So I've always been interested in alternative treatments. Uh, when I say alternative, they're not really alternative. At the end of the day, cannabis has been around forever. And so have so many other um, things that um, probably were used you know, being used as medicines uh, in the past. You know, now we're learning much more about psychedelics and MDMA, et cetera, et cetera, ketamine. Um, and um, for me, sort of having experiences, you know, with patients really struggling to move forward um, made me want to look at alternative ways to, to support them looking at um, different herbs, um, Ayurvedic medicine, uh, which, you know, which has been around for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, actually, there is reference to Soma in the Vedic texts, um, which, though it's not been concluded to be cannabis, suspected to, to, be, to be cannabis. And, um, you know, many sort of references to, to it in early texts as well. Um, so, um, in terms of the prescribing, um, a patient gets referred or self refers to, to, to an individual clinic. Um, it's important that they have two licensed uh, treatments. And I said two licensed treatments, uh, as I'm in the sphere of mental health, it, this will be, um, this could be a medication or two medications that they've already tried for a mental health condition, or it could be a medication and it could be a psychological therapy as well. So something like CBT or psychodynamic psychotherapy uh, as well. Um, we also uh, need to ensure that we have adequate information prior to any appointment. So we'll send a medical questionnaire and in that, we'll have all the basic details, the demographics, um, any conditions, any medical conditions, allergies, and really importantly, have they already been trying cannabis and what, um, what strains, um, if they are aware of any, have been helpful to them because that informs our, our treatment decisions as well. Then we come to uh, an assessment and we provide uh, the treatment plan and the treatment plan can be dependent on a whole, you know, host of uh, host of factors um, presenting condition. We've got to remember that there's not one size fits all uh, in you know medical cannabis treatment. Um, we know from Mike's talk that um, THC and various other cannabinoids have specific effects on the body, and we really have to weigh up, you know, what level of particular, you know, CBD, THC. But there's, you know, there's like, we know hundreds and hundreds of the cannabinoids um, and uh, we're, we're learning much, much more as time goes on. And we'll be learning much more about, um, you know, minor cannabinoids, um, flavonoids, um, terpenes as well in the near future. These have all have important implications in treatment. So we'll produce a treatment plan um, and all these treatment plans need to be cross-checked by a multidisciplinary team. So in this multidisciplinary team, um, we'll have um, a uh, doctor who's specializing in mental health, so a psychiatrist, uh, a pain doctor who will be referring to the pain consultations, a neurologist and uh, yeah, a nurse as well. And the reason why we have an MDT is to really just cross check that every, you know, everything's been done solidly throughout the consultation and that they feel that this is uh, an appropriate uh, treatment plan. So what kind of conditions do I see? Um, so the next slide, please, Max. Lots, and I think we're gonna be seeing a growing number uh, as time goes on as well. Um, so these are just uh, a few of them. Anxiety, probably more than any uh, of these others. 
Um, but it's important to note that a lot of these conditions don't occur in silos. Uh, there's lots of overlap between uh, these conditions. You know, we are, you know, people at the end of the day, we're not just diagnoses. So this will, you know, there's lots of uh, different mixtures and also with physical health because the mind and body, much as kind of modern medicine, uh, you know, kind of boxes them in separately. And we have all these various specialties like heart and lungs and liver and all that sort of stuff. The mind and body are connected. Uh, there's, there's very little doubt about that. And um, often, you know, people who have mental health conditions may experience uh, quite commonly pain or, uh, you know, conditions like uh, Claire has, like fibromyalgia, for example. And so um, we need to be conscious that, uh, you know, that, you know, these are people who can have, uh, you know, multiple, multiple problems uh, and just not uh, one, one singular one. So uh, insomnia, chronic insomnia, very common, depression, uh, anxiety is said were quite quite prominent. Post traumatic stress, so people might have experienced some specific traumas, um, which have resulted in um, you know, flashbacks, nightmares, um, being on edge all the time, high degrees of anxiety. Also, then trying to cope with those kind of traumas might may also end up using recreation, uh, recreational drugs or alcohol to really try and uh, mitigate those symptoms. Attention deficit hyperactive disorder and um, yeah, medical cannabis works wonders uh, in this condition. Uh, that's, that, that's been my observation um, uh, with the treatment. And mental illness associated with autism. Uh, autism isn't a mental disorder in itself, um, but it can be associated with anxiety, depression, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder as well. And I have a couple of patients who are prescribed um, in dementia as well, specifically Alzheimer's dominant. Now, generally people don't have, you know, one singular form of dementia. They do have a little mixture of various things, whether it's Alzheimer's and vascular. Um, but um, I've noted that to be beneficial really in reducing anxiety levels, improving sleep pattern as well. And that can be also important for cognitive symptoms uh, of dementia. Uh, next slide, please, Max. So here are just a couple of uh, case examples. Um, I um, treated a 34-year-old with ADHD. Um, they've been on various medications. The treatment for ADHD are, are actually ironically stimulants. Um, and the reason for that is um, basically in the frontal cortex, the front part of the brain, there is a deficiency of dopamine, which is then um, said to be uh, causing the attention concentration problems, uh, the inner restlessness that's associated um, with adult ADHD. Um, and um, this, this is a condition that, that, that starts in childhood. Um, but for many people actually uh, may have been undiagnosed. So now we're seeing a lot of adults um, come to the fore um, who've had assessments, uh, but may have been struggling quite a considerable you know, amount of their lives. And many of them do actually self-medicate with cannabis. Um, so this particular individual, I prescribed a mixture of oils and flour in the day. Oils, because they're slow release, they sort of gradually get into the system and flower for what we call kind of breakthrough symptoms uh, of anxiety. Um, and these are balanced products. So essentially, uh, we, by balance, I mean that they had a balance of THC and CBD. And, you know, they work synergistically, but the CBD, you know, negates any potential problems of the THC uh, and vice versa. And also they were prescribed um, uh, a THC 20% uh, oil at night time. Again, oil's important because it's slow release and it lasts longer. The thing about flour is it gets in the system very quick, but also leaves the system quick. So not at all that ideal really, um, to, you know, to ensure like an adequate night's sleep. Um, four weeks later, which tend, when we tend to follow up, um, they had improved attention and concentration reduced restlessness. So people with ADHD do complain of subjective inner restlessness. And this had abated, as did their anxiety, 
had improved sleep pattern and overall improved quality of life. Um, and the best barometer often is um, a spouse, really. And the spouse had reported that uh, husband was a changed man. Um, she finally got her husband back, was a report. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's a good testimony, really, if anything. Um, and another case example is a 29 year old with PTSD uh, having intrusive, oh, okay, sorry, yep. Uh, intrusive thoughts, flashbacks, nightmares, being on edge, uh, anxiety and insomnia. Tried lots and lots of different medications and a psychological therapy called EMDR, which uh, just stands for very long term yeah, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Uh, try saying that repeatedly in succession. Um, and they'd help to a degree. Um, but one thing which a lot of psychiatric patients complain of is this feeling of being numb and feeling numb on, on medicines. Um, so um, they themselves were self medicating. Uh, we prescribed flowers for the day and night with an eventual transition to oils. So what I do discuss with patients is a kind of forward trajectory plan around, you know, if we're having flour, um, you know, eventually kind of move towards oils, and many do actually, um, which is uh, which is good. Um, their sort of general sort of psychiatric medications uh, were reduced, their, their nightmares and flashbacks abated, sleep improved, anxiety uh, as well and um, great improved quality of life now as a supermarket job. So I've seen some really good outcomes um, as well. And, uh, you know, these kind of outcomes that get captured, uh, you know, really important research projects such as Project 21. Uh, next slide, Max. Okay. So in terms of the future, um, yeah, I think we'll be seeing obviously different delivery methods um, of, prescribing. At the moment, we've got flour, we've got oils, we've got soft gels, we've got vape cartridges. You know, we'll see certainly an expansion of that. What I'd like to be seeing more and more uh, emphasis on, I'm sure this will happen as well, is on terpenes and flavonoids and other minor cannabinoids, because there are certain terpenes that will be useful in uh, stress, anxiety, depression, for example, limonene um, or linalool as well for sleep. Um, so, you know, certificate analysis and when we are actually discussing things with patients will be much more emphasis on these on these components of the cannabis plant. Um, increased knowledge about how other lifestyle choices influence endocannabinoid systems, sleep, exercise, um, dietary intake, uh, which is hugely important as well. Um, Franz, you mentioned about um, education. That's absolutely crucial. We need to be learning about this in medical school. Um, you know, it's an absolute crucial part. This endocannabinoid system is the fundamental system which influences all the other, uh, you know, all the other sy uh, systems. So we really need to be getting to grips with this and, and learning more. Um, building the evidence, uh, as I said, you know, um, naturalistic studies such as you know, Project Twenty One offer. Uh, but also, you know, ensuring that uh, we are recording data and, and uh, you, know, uh, you know, taking kind of measuring outcomes uh, for our patients as well. Um, it's important that we do get more doctors on board and um, the member of the committee in the UK uh, Medical Cannabis Clinician Society. If there are any docs on here, please do have a look and do consider joining and getting, uh, getting the training. Uh, you know, it's really good just to just to have, uh, you know, some further sort of insight into this uh, wonderful industry. Um, and, you know, we, it's not just down to secondary care. We really do need to get primary care on board and they should be allowed to prescribe. We should be allowed, you know, nurse prescribers, pharmacists, uh, primary care, um, the GPs are, you know, the, the first port of call for many. Um, if they're allowed to prescribe, antidepressants um, I can't see no reason why they should be able to prescribe medical cannabis um, but I'm sure that will come uh, in time it will be uh, uh, it will eventually happen uh, as it has to um, so that's um, that's it from me 
and happy to take any questions. Brilliant, thank you so, so much. Thank you for persevering, even with the technical difficulties which have been plaguing us all evening. Um, I think unfortunately we, um, <laughs> we're probably out of time for, for questions for all our last speakers. Um, but if anyone does have any burning questions, um, Mags has put the email address into the chat, but it's info at drugscience.org.uk. I had to write it down, very easy to remember, but I still wrote it down. Um, so if you do have any questions still, please uh, send us an email and we'll get back to you as quick as possible and hopefully direct it to the right speaker for you. Thank you so much to all of our speakers uh, this evening for giving us your time and thank you to all our audience members for giving us your time. Um, oh, very last plug that I must do is that we've got the um, Student Psychedelic Conference coming up on the 9th and 10th of August, uh, August April. So much more sooner than August. Um, we did it last year. It was a lot of fun. Um, so please do come again. We've got lots of great talks and, and speakers coming. And that is everything, I think. Um, this was recorded, so it will be up on the Drug Science YouTube um, within April at some point, but I can't say exactly when. And yeah, thank you all so much.